one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 1st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, three degrees in Ottawa, five degrees in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Pope Francis expressed his sorrow and his shame at the abuses suffered by Indigenous people at church-run residential schools in Canada. This long-awaited apology came during an address at the Vatican this morning. Our Laura Carney was listening in. This historic moment happening at the Vatican, a papal apology for the Catholic Church's role in Canada's residential schools. And I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. And I join my brothers, the Canadian bishops, in asking your pardon. Pope Francis says he's ashamed and indignant at the deplorable abuses suffered by Indigenous peoples at the hands of Catholic educators. In this way, great harm was done to your identity and your culture. Many families were separated and great numbers of children fell victim. Speaking Outside the Vatican, Chief Gerald Antoine, the Assembly of First Nations delegation lead, says they've been waiting for this day, but more is still needed. The next step is for the Holy Father to apologize to our family at their home. Pope Francis has committed to coming to Canada. A date has not been set, but delegates said it could be as soon as this summer. Laura Carney, City News. City News time, 9.01. Now your forecast. Here's meteorologist Jill Taylor. Well, after a brief warm-up, it's back to colder air and some snow at times. No major accumulations, if anything, just some flurries. Already reached our high for the day for the afternoon. We'll sit at about 2, minus 4 for the low. And for the weekend, sun and clouds Saturday, but back to some flurries or showers for Sunday. For today, the high already reached for the afternoon near 2. And right now, 3 degrees in Ottawa, 5 degrees in Smith Falls. Ukrainian authorities say Russian forces have left the damaged Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Ukraine's state power company, Energy Atom, says the pullout at Chernobyl came after soldiers received significant doses of radiation from digging trenches in the forest in the exclusion zone around the closed plant. The International Atomic Energy Agency says it cannot independently confirm the exposure claim. The company adds some Russian forces had set off towards the Belarusian border. I'm Charles Duladesma. City News Time at 9.02. Well, the latest boost in the price at the pumps can be blamed on the war in Ukraine, but also on carbon tax. The federal government moving ahead. Today, the national price on pollution increased, adding 2.2 cents a litre to gas in most provinces. Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo says the government will not stall or move backwards because the carbon price is seen as a cornerstone policy of the federal government's climate plan. It is a big step forward, returning to the days of pre-pandemic travel. Vaccinated travellers can now enter Canada without getting a COVID-19 test. While that has sparked a surge in travel bookings, many parts of the country, others are seeing rising cases in a more contagious subvariant of Omicron. That could lead to restrictions being imposed once again. And even though several scientists have warned we're already in a sixth wave of COVID in Ontario, the health minister says it's not necessary to reintroduce any public health measures. Christine Elliott was asked about how the province will respond to virus infections and hospitalizations on the rise. She says the current rise in cases was not unexpected after the province ended most public health measures like the mask mandates. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. your opinion. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Ah, Friday. We made it. Made it to April. April Fool's Day. I'm not a big fan of April Fool's Day jokes. The news is unbelievable enough of the time. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Very busy program ahead. He's been minding Ottawa's business all week. Tom Korski, managing editor, Black Locks reporter, digging into the inner workings of our federal government and how it spends your money. For example, speaking of money, $88 billion, 
$88 billion. Okay, this is a story Blacklocks has this morning. $88 billion. Okay, that's a lot of money, right? That's still a lot of money. $88 billion. $88 billion in government spending comes before the Senate. The upper chamber of sober second thought. I don't know. Maybe they wanted to hit the bars. I don't know. $88 billion in spending. And senators take all of 50 minutes. 50 minutes, less than an hour, to pass $88 billion in spending. Newsworthy because some senators have been complaining of late that they feel rushed, that the Trudeau government keeps rushing them and expects them to rubber stamp legislation. So then $88 billion comes before them and it's passed in, uh, oh, 50 minutes. I guess somewhere they got to be, I guess. Who knows what's in there? Not many senators do, I can guarantee you that. We will also talk uh, with Tom. This was one of their stories this week about a new tax that the government is being pressured into considering a new green tax. Green, of course, a green levy, a levy. Yeah, see, a lot of people don't want to use the word tax, right? They'll call them anything but taxes. Call them levies, call them prices. Call, yeah, I love how taxes become prices. That's miraculous. But how about a tax of at least $1,000 at least $1,000 on pickup trucks and SUVs. All in the name of being green. Slap a, a, a special tax on pickup trucks and SUVs. What were the top five best-selling vehicles in Canada last year? Oh, four pickup trucks and one SUV. <laughs> and not an electric among them. Cha-ching. Also on the show this morning, the host of Daytime Ottawa on Rogers Television, Derek Fage. He's with us every Friday morning with a hot take on the current events of the day of the week of this time in our lives. Talk about the carbon tax. Yeah, the carbon tax. The carbon tax went up this morning to $50 a ton, 25% higher than it was, oh, just this time yesterday. You know, some media outlets are, you know, they're pointing it out. Well, it only adds 2.2 cents a liter to the price of gasoline. You know, so, you know, no big deal, right? What are you complaining about? It's only 2.2 cents a liter more. Well, if that's all it's adding to the price of gas, shouldn't you ask, what good is it, really? as a disincentive. Another 2.2 cents a liter on the price of gas. This, this, will solve the climate crisis? How? Especially if you believe the government's claim that you get all the money back and then some. <laughs> so just what is someone's incentive to trade in that F-150? If the carbon tax is actually a money maker for them, maybe they should buy an F-250. Make even more money. Oh, yeah, and the liberals are sticking to that line. They, they repeated that over and over and over again yesterday in the House of Commons during the question period. Carbon tax, best tax ever. Because you make, you make money from the carbon tax. I put that to people this week. Not a lot of believers in that line from the liberals. But it's the liberal line. And they're sticking to it. I'll tell you what, the carbon tax is proving to be great fodder for Pierre Polyev. He had an event last night here in Ottawa, an anti-carbon tax rally at the Infinity Center. And I wasn't there, but from what I've read about it, it was quite the show. And that campaign, that Paul have campaign for conservative leader, I don't I don't know, David. My gosh, right? Everywhere he goes. Everywhere he goes. He's jamming him in there. Like it's a movement. Somebody said uh Sheree had a an online event the other day, like so come and listen to Sheree online, like thirty two people on the call. 
Ooh. Polly have like less than 24 hours notice come to the Infinity Center and a thousand people show up. It's like a rock star. I don't know how anybody can beat him right now. He is just packing him in no matter where he goes. And he was on his home turf last night, and I guess he brought the house down. So we'll talk about, about that. Uh, Paxlovid, that is in the news. That's the antiviral therapy for COVID-19, if you can get it, right? If you can get it, that's the problem. One of our colleagues here, uh, Amy from Shea, having a terrible time just navigating the healthcare maze after being uh, prescribed this, this new drug, Paxlovid. That's on the front page of the newspaper this morning. You know, go here, call there, wait for calls back, go there. No, don't go there. It's just ridiculous. So what is going on with this drug? We will speak with Jen Belcher, pharmacist and also vice president of Ontario Pharmacists Association. Frustration is the key word by the sound of frustration for the patient, frustration for the doctor, the family, the pharmacy, everyone involved. We are following a developing story this morning, the Pope. This is our top story. Uh, the Pope has apologized. I mean, this is a huge story. Pope Francis has apologized for the conduct of members of the Roman Catholic Church for the abuses that happened in the Indian residential schools. And nobody expected that. And uh, the delegates have been there all week. They were not expecting that. And the reports say they are very pleased, the delegates in Rome, very pleased that the Pope said what he said. And this is the quote by way of CBC News from Pope Francis, quote, I also feel shame, sorrow and shame for the role that a number of Catholics, particularly those with educational responsibilities, have had in all of these things that wounded you and the abuses you suffered and the lack of respect shown for your identity, your culture, and even your spiritual values. For the deplorable conduct of these members of the Catholic Church, I ask for God's forgiveness, and I want to say with you with all my heart I am very sorry, and I join my brothers, the Canadian bishops, in asking your pardon. Like, wow, wow. Historic. And uh, he's coming to Canada this summer. So we are following that story this morning. We're chasing that one right now. We will do the Queen's Park Weekend Review at 1130 with our MPPs. The... Child care deal between the Ford government and the Trudeau government. I imagine that's going to be a major source of debate for our MPPs this morning. And the talk back hour is coming up for you between 10 and 11 o'clock. Friday free for all today. So we're pretty much wide open on any topic. We've been coming up with topics all week. I mean, we've talked about $10 a day child care. We've talked about the carbon tax. Talked about fighting climate change. We talked about potholes. <laughs> that was a hot one. It's been a busy week in news, but it doesn't have to be in the news at all. Whatever it is that's on your mind, within reason, we're usually good to roll with it at 750-1310 because that's what we do around here. The news and your views on the news on The Rob Snow Show on City News. I was so excited when I found out that I was given this grant to be able to make this this concert because I knew it was going to be the first opportunity that I was able to play these songs for others. You know, this album was recorded really truly in isolation. Like everybody else, we were locked down for a bit. So you're going to see, I think, the joy of playing live, of being together. For me, as someone who owns a business in Ottawa that's directly working with music, I own a recording studio, it is important because it gives a sense of confidence in terms of having support from a lot of different places. Uh, we all know in Canada 
There are all kinds of city, provincial, and federal uh, people who provide funding for artists. And just seeing how invested Ottawa is and expanding the reputation of Ottawa as a music and entertainment city, running a business in that city, just it makes you just feel better that someone's going to support you, help you, and have your back. Well, firstly, I'm seeing friends that I haven't seen in two years, so that is kind of stabbing me in the heart a little bit. But I'm also just so happy to be able to make art with all of these friends again. And I've been treated like an absolute rock star from the moment I just kind of knocked on the door and said, hey, can I unload my gear? Uh, everybody's so helpful, and you're just used to kind of dragging all your stuff around, and it's such a hard business to be in. So this is a dream come true for any local artist who gets to participate in a series like this. Oh, I, I feel like I need to keep pinching myself. It's an amazing experience and opportunity for us, so thank you so much. It's been a long couple months. Uh, our last show was... Uh, in December. This is the first time we've actually been in the same room together since. So it's, uh, it's really an amazing opportunity for us and the beautiful theater and to have Rogers here and thank you, oh Mike, and so it's a dream come true. I'm here with one of my best friends, Alex, and we haven't performed in almost two years because of COVID and it feels really good to be back on a big stage like Meridian, and I'm uh, really honored that you guys invited me here today. Having an organization that lets the artists do their thing with such a range of styles and influence and to kind of have that ability to meet the public and to meet the people who would listen to them can't be overstated so super excited about it i know a lot of musicians in town and a lot of music lovers in town who are really excited about it too so i mean it's it's an event in which there's talk you know there's a lot of buzz around it and i wouldn't be surprised if it goes on for a long time and does a lot of great things for for local musicians and connecting them with the listeners that love them Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. He's been minding Ottawa's business all week. The managing editor at Blacklocks reporter Tom Korski is back with us on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Rob. Hope you had a great week. Yeah, we got yeah. we got our chores done. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, busy, busy. Lots of lots of stuff. Lots of heavy duty news. I want to get into because uh, uh, climate carbon, uh, uh, all big news this week with the federal government unveiling its its climate plan. The carbon tax goes up today, and and meantime, the Department of the Environment is mulling maybe even more carbon type taxes in order to get us out of I don't know carbon belching pickup trucks and and SUVs tell us uh, uh, about uh, what is being considered by way of the green levy Tom the green levy it sounds good doesn't it, it sounds great just don't you know, don't call it a tax <laughs> what do we do no, what, tax what, is such a dirty word it is 1000 to 4000 dollars on a vehicle powered with an internal combustion engine that runs on gas or diesel. Well, I just described uh, over 85% of the road vehicles in Canada. This has been pondered for years, but we see three reports in the last four months, uh, one by Cabinet Advisory Committee, then uh, a reference with approval by the Department of Environment, and the other by a group called uh, Green Budget Coalition, Smart Lobbyists, former directors, the current Minister of the Environment. They love the idea of taxing pickups, SUVs, motor vehicles used by mother and father if they burn gasoline or diesel because they say they want to use that money to offer even more rebates to people who buy Teslas. Fraught with controversy, but they won't drop it, Rob. You can tell. They're, they're sniffing around this. They like the idea. They, they can hear the cash register ring. We need a hierarchy of solutions, it says. Reduce internal combustion engine-driven trips and distances travel, especially for personal transportation. They don't like it that people drive for personal reasons. <laughs> okay, uh, that's one. Transfer to zero emission and more communal 
and active modes. I love that. Communal and active <laughs> mode. Communal. <laughs> Ride the, 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 the proletariat chariot. There you go. And uh, improve the performance of vehicles. Okay, that may be the only noble part. But this is key. This is key, and this is why it's worth watching. Uh, November 17th report drops, as you said, from the Green Budget Coalition calling for a $4,000 tax on SUVs. And the former director of the coalition, Mr. Gibo, now the Minister of the Environment. So, um, yes, very much worth following. Very much worth following. Very important. Great story. All right, let's move on to your ongoing coverage of Blacklock's reporter of the aftermath of the truckers' protest here in Ottawa. The examination continues into the government's use of, use of the Emergencies Act. The author of the Emergencies Act was Perrin Beatty, wrote the law 34 years ago. He is now the CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. In fact, I had had um, Perrin Beatty on my program during the, uh, during the protest uh, to talk about not specifically what was happening here in Ottawa, but the blockade of the Ambassador Bridge because um, that was so impacting Canadian commerce and he was quite concerned about it. But that was before actually they enacted, the government enacted the Emergencies Act. What is Perrin Beattie saying about the use of the legislation that he authored? He's telling the uh, MPs and senators who are conducting a year-long review of cabinet's use of that against the truck drivers, you want to ask yourself very hard questions. Why was this necessary? What brought you to this point? And were there alternatives available to the police? He said the question you must not ask yourself is, was this handy? for the police that no one cares if that was useful for the constables in wrapping that convoy up because we're not here to brighten the day for the police department we're here to balance law enforcement with something called civil liberties and constitutional rights it's quite complicated that was Beatty's message to the review committee it doesn't matter if it was efficient or the police found it useful the question is was it justified and why was it brought in in the first place crucial questions Rob because the implication is this was political score settling by cabinet there's been no evidence and I stress zero evidence that this was justified based on lawlessness by the Freedom Convoy. Okay, so that was at one committee at the Transport Committee, House of Commons Transport Committee. MPs heard from a Department of Public Safety Manager by the name of Ryan Schwartz. Who is he and what did he have to say? Yeah, Schwartz is, is quite a character. He's acting director general of, of cybersecurity at his department. He said that the Freedom Convoy, their internet traffic threatened social cohesion. He did, social co- <laughs> threatened social cohesion? He, wow. It threatened social cohesion. He did not define what that means, and uh, oddly, no member of the committee took it up on him, but Schwartz went out of his way to, to point this out. You would think this man would have his hands full with Russian and Chinese cybersecurity agents, hackers, ransomware. No, now Schwartzy <laughs> is the social cohesion hall monitor, and he's going to oh. determine who is using the internet in a way that he doesn't like over at the Department of Public Safety. It was frankly unbelievable testimony, but the, the, <laughs> you are so far into government overreach when it comes to cabinet's approach to the internet that it's often highly entertaining and perplexing at the same time. Okay, yeah, and we'll have more on that in a moment. Now, let's talk about the Public Health Agency of Canada and the quarantine hotels, um, which, from my recollection, not getting rave reviews on TripAdvisor, the quarantine hotels. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if, I, if I recall, like, you know, you, no, 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 you don't want to stay here. No, they like one star, one star. Um, but look, uh, lots of lots of rooms booked, lots of, of money spent. So uh, this was the quarantine program for international travels uh, ha- travelers. How much were these rooms costing per night? Yeah, they 
they spent two hundred million on this. You, you, they were booking two thousand rooms a month. Wow. You, you'd think if you're booking two thousand rooms a month, you'd get a pretty good bulk deal. They were paying up to one hundred and thirty-nine dollars a night. One hundred and thirty-nine dollars a night. One hundred and thirty-nine. Wow. They were paying the commercial. They were paying the commercial walk-in rate. They were paying the Tom Korski rate. That's what I get when I walk in when I don't book it on Hotwire. One hundred and thirty-nine bucks a night. Auditors looked at this and said this was a schmozzle. It cost a fortune. It didn't get it done. And the program was a complete failure. But if you wanted to hose taxpayers, book your rooms through the Public Health Agency of Canada, because that's what happened. It's so like $2 million a hotel? Something like yeah, that? They're, they're, oh, monthly. They're monthly. Hotels. monthly. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Holy cow. Man, oh, man. At least you'd think for that money you'd get a decent meal. Now, um, Digital Safety Commissioner. This is something to pay attention to because in the next few months, over the course of uh, the balance of the year, have to pay very close attention to what the Trudeau government is planning for internet regulation. Black Locks has, has been all over this. So the government is looking at creating a new government position called a Digital Safety Commissioner. What would be that person's responsibility? I love the name. I love the title. Well, he, it, that would be chief federal censor of the Internet. Uh, and I mean censor legal content. Police are already on illegal content. It's already illegal to use websites for child pornography, uh, meth dealing, terror financing, hate speech. Parliament abolished that in 1970. No new laws required. This is legal content, but but the, the title is absolutely fantastic. Digital Safety Commissioner. It's like House of Special Purpose, Rob. Like you just know what's going on in the basement there is not good. That's that's you want to avoid that place on Halloween. Mm. The Digital Safety Commissioner. It's like the Internet Hygiene Officer is going to uh, take complaints, according to a Department of Canadian Heritage technical paper. He even take anonymous complaints about internet content that hurts people's feelings. He may have to hold in camera, that is secret hearings, and would have powers to block websites. What's the problem? Well, 9,000 people read that technical paper, their heads exploded, and they submitted very negative comments to the minister's uh, department. The minister this week, uh, Pablo Rodriguez, appointed a 12-member panel, maybe mainly professors, to give him tips on how to censor the Internet. Uh, I, I'm with you. you. You have to watch this one like a hawk. Right, right. Because, and, the, the, you know, the thing to, to keep in mind is much of what the digital safety commissioner would be would be policing is already policed is already against the law hate speech already against the law as you say can't sell illegal dr drugs over the internet as, as you, you it's it's already illegal to promote uh, terrorism uh, online uh, we have uh, child pornography offenses already on the books and yet as part of this is part of Bill C eleven, I assume this is all part of the uh, under this umbrella of, of C eleven. There would be a new digital safety commissioner, be responsible for these five aspects of online behavior, and you're talking about the ability to um, go into homes, to issue notices, to um, order the takedown of certain content to. To block websites, what some have called uh, the Internet Kill Switch. This would be uh, the person in charge of the Internet Kill Switch. And I stress legal content, Rob. Legal content. He's after yeah. legal content. You don't need the commissioner if you see terror financing on, on the Internet. You just call 911. You just call the, the police are right on that. He's after legal content that hurts people's feelings. Okay. You think about that. Yeah, that, we will. Well, we that will. really covers the waterfront. We will. I mean, my we feelings will. are hurt all the yeah. time. We <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's almost the weekend, so cheer up, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Tom Korski. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Big soon. Tom Korski, managing editor, Black Locks reporter. Some of the things said eh, in government. Crazy. Crazy. Coming up after the news, Derek Fage, daytime Ottawa host on Rogers Television. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News.
in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 1st, April Fool's Day. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, three degrees, and here's what's making news this hour. Pope Francis has apologized for the Roman Catholic Church's role in residential schools, telling an Indigenous delegation from Canada... I ask for God's forgiveness, and I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. Francis promised he will come to Canada. There are some who feel that could happen as early as July, although no firm date for a papal visit has been set. Gas prices increased again overnight, and that was partially due to the ongoing conflict in Russia, but also partly due to the 2.2 cent a liter increase due to the carbon tax. And hats off to Library and Archives Canada for a, treat, a tweet on this April 1st, declaring Ryan Reynolds a national treasure that must be protected at all costs. Right now, the Library and Archives, though, says he's on loan to the U.S. National Archives. He will be preserved for future generations in a world-class climate-controlled vault. City News Time, 9.32. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Derek Fage is the host of Daytime Ottawa on Rogers Television. He's with us every Friday morning. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. good. How was your week? Uh, excellent week. Excellent. You know, things okay. seem to be feeling like they're they're back to normal. A lot of musical guests, so you know, a lot of musical guests with um, you know releasing new music. They've had a lot of time uh, during the pandemic to put some new music together. So certainly excited to get back out and uh, start performing in front of live audiences. Theatrical productions are back. You know, it's Sugar Bush season. Uh, events like the Ottawa Wedding Show returning. You know, Ukraine fundraisers, community events. So it's uh, it's been a busy week. It's been a great week so far. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, what about the price of gas, though? That's not. Oh good. boy! Yeah, right? Happy carbon tax day! Rob. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, you know, like, boy! Um, the price of oil went down big time yesterday. It was like down five or six percent because of this Biden news mm-hmm. releasing like a million barrels of oil a day, a day. Yeah. Uh, from the U.S. strategic petroleum reserve because he's getting heck in the United States about high gas prices or midterm elections and everything. He, his popularity is, is falling because the cost of living is rising. Sounds and, familiar. And in the, <laughs> in the meantime, there's just like it's no relief from, from Mr. Trudeau and, 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 yeah. and like no apology at all. Like, no, we must do this. You know, the planet is at stake. What do you think about Trudeau oh. refusing to um, like hit the pause button on hiking Just the carbon? completely out of touch, Rob. Really? Completely out yeah. of touch. Like, I think yeah. he has been, quite frankly, um, since halfway through his last term and the beginning of this term. Um, 
just don't I don't understand I, you know it, it's not it's not as though Canadians are certainly some are asking him to cancel it it's not as though he had to cancel um, you know the carbon tax but certainly to put it off you know and this is the problem Rob wealthy politicians and academics like you just said they're going to tell us this increase is negligible when our climate crisis is taking in, uh, taken into account but they don't live paycheck to paycheck you know they, they just don't live in the same reality no. I mean you know they have a responsibility to look out for Canadians who are coping with you know rising costs of everything housing and food and uh, you know all your other utilities yeah um you know saying that he's out of touch is putting it mildly oh really oh, I think i'm being think too it, kind i'm being too kind. well yeah i just think it's frustrating rob uh, you know we have talked about climate change and i'm not a climate change denier i understand it's happening i would like us to be um you know uh, a country that 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 shows progress that that is an example to other countries but at the end of the day we th- we as a country are responsible for less than 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. And you can't put it on individuals' backs all the time. And this is what continues to happen in Canada. I mean, we're not alone, but, uh, you know, we're talking about our country. Yeah. It continues to be put on the backs of individuals. Like, how much more can I do? Even at a municipal level, Rob, remember when we were asked to save water and we all did a wonderful job with water consumption and how we were saving and, and lowering our consumption. And then what did they say? Oh, now we don't have enough revenue. Now we have to you know, raise the cost of, of your water bill. This it, it just continues to be like this. Where like go after the big corporation. Yeah. We're not responsible for the bloody pollution. I mean, I just see, you know, for example, um, and we can question the wisdom of like the province of Quebec is giving five hundred dollars to everybody, you know, to right. offset the cost of inflation. Uh, um, out out in British Columbia, they have an NDP government. Everybody is getting one hundred and ten bucks. Like, like I don't, in, in BC, that might get you half a tank of gas. I was going to say, yeah, you can fill up maybe <laughs> half to three quarters of a tank. <laughs> the way, but nevertheless, well, we have, hold on, Rob. But, we have okay. the climate action incentive payment, <laughs> which I don't even know. If you go on their website, you can't even find out if you're eligible. Right? Well, it, well, that, it, but it, that will be determined through your income tax. Through, it, through your right? tax yeah. return, right. Yeah, it's not yeah, a credit yeah. this time around, but CRA will, yeah, they're, they're going to determine your eligibility. Yeah. Once but I guess my point is, you know, I look like Biden, you know, Biden's not a conservative. Biden is like a left wing liberal Democrat. Right. Yeah. Who, uh, and but he has built this reputation of really being a fighter for the working class. That's been like the hallmark of his career. So, you know, yeah, from Scranton, Joe fighting for the working man, you know, and, and, and isn't uh, that what we expected from Trudeau. Well, he right. used to say all the time, you know, the middle class and those working hard to join it. Well, it's getting harder and harder to join the middle class with these crushing. So I just look, um, uh, California, Gavin Newsom, like a more liberal politician you would not find than Gavin Newsom, yeah. the governor of California. 400 bucks for every car owner because of yeah. uh, high gas price. And the gas price in the United States, like $1.40 a liter. I know. Um, I know. So anyway, so David and I showed David a story this morning. Chicago, like liberals have been running Chicago for 100 years. The liberals have run Chicago. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama's hometown. The mayor of Chicago yesterday announces a lottery for free gas. (laughs) Free gas. We have a report. We have a report. This is CBS. Chicago. Right now, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot just announcing $12.5 million in transportation cost relief. They're calling it Chicago Moves. It's a financial assistance program that will help with the spiking cost of gas, all the rising inflation for so many Chicago residents. It will include prepaid gas part cards and CTA cards, too. Chicago Moves will issue up to 50,000 preloaded gas cards of $150 each to be distributed to eligible residents through a lottery system that can be used at any local uh, Chicago filling station. The mayor also announced distributing 100,000 cards for use on public transit. That would be about $50 each. Applications to apply will open on April 27th, and it's still pending city council approval. No, but not in Canada. 
Not nope. in Canada. It's crazy. Well, and, and Rob, like, free, I mean, gas. Of, free gas. Free yes, gas. I know, but instead of this free gas, and here's four hundred bucks, and here's one hundred and ten bucks, just cut the bloody taxes <laughs> off the gas price uh, and help everybody uh, across man. the board. I yeah, know, man. It, it's, I'll it's tell you what. Um, they're they're just handing it to Polyev, though, don't you think? Like the Infinity <laughs> Center is, you've been there, I'm sure, yeah, Derek, the Infinity yeah. Center. I mean, big, big ballroom there, right? Less yeah. than 24 hours notice, he packs the place for an anti-carbon tax rally. Packs mm-hmm. the place, packs yeah. the place. Um, he, 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 and he is attracting crowds wherever he goes. No matter the time of day, no matter he's what the part newest, of the country he's, he's the newest political celebrity, Rob. Yeah, and you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Polyev. I've always said to you, though, I think he's very smart. He's he's well spoken. He can he can rally people. Obviously, as, as as we've seen, I'm just not I'm not a huge fan of political rallies. I mean, as I said, politicians are acting like they're celebrities in recent years. There's all this you know frothing at the mouth and and, and rallies and and photo ops, you know. And the majority of these people, by the way, are wealthy people pretending to understand the struggles of everyday Canadian. They don't. Mm. They don't understand. I mean, I don't know. I just don't like the language he uses at times. I mean, you talk about division. What, what has he said? And you know what? And I appreciated what he was saying, that, that, that Justin Trudeau has created this division. He didn't act as a leader. He didn't show any understanding for those that, that were vaccine hesitant or did not want to get a vaccine, that you know don't trust the government and so forth. But he's doing the same thing. You can't say it out of one side of your mouth and then on the other side say, well, you know, uh, uh, he's dividing Canadians, but I'm not. Of course he's dividing Canadians, right? Okay. All I right. mean, that's but, what these rallies are doing. You think so? You think well, so? with the language he uses, yes, yeah. I think so. Okay, all right. Um, you have another poll. There's another poll out. Uh, Doug Ford, PC Party, like well on its way to winning a second majority government. Yeah. Why do you think that is? <laughs> I, I have two reasons for that. Okay. Stephen Del Duca yeah. and Andrea Horvath. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. Rob, yeah. these are these are leaders? Come on. I You know, I had a rant when I filled in for you, uh, you know, a couple of months back, just saying, you know, where we have to change things are at the membership side. When okay. you when you are, are voting for the leader of your political party, federally or provincially, we have to do better. We have, I mean, they've, you know, and, and then the two of them have both re- recently hinted at a possible coalition if Doug Ford wins a minority government. Well, um, if you continue hinting on that, those poll numbers are going to go up, right? They, they, they can't, you know, they can scare off liberal voters with that. The NDP and the liberals are polling with almost identical numbers. Yeah. Stealing from each other, Rob, votes from each other is not going to win them a minority, never mind a majority. They need to win votes from the conservative government, and they're not doing a very good job, and I think it's because they they don't have very strong leadership. I mean, there was another poll not that long ago that had the Ford PCs up by 26 points in the 905. Like 26 points. Yeah. Like if they're up by 26 points in the 905, like it's going to be an early night. I'll oh, absolutely. Right absolutely. Uh, we, we know who's not voting for them, right? Um, unions, uh, teachers, um, provincial, probably government workers. Nurses. Uh, but nurses, yeah. Nurses, nurses absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, healthcare field. But beyond that, I don't know. When you look at the alternatives, I think a lot of people are going to say, hey, yeah. you know what? I, I didn't necessarily you know, speaking- agree with everything he did in the pandemic, but he did have some of the tightest restrictions in, in North America. Sure. Yeah, and you know whether you're a fan of him or not, that that's just the truth. Yeah, a lot is being made about him and Trudeau doing that event this week on the ten dollar a day childcare and um, how buddy buddy they are now. You know, like, yeah. Um, think back to the 2019 election. <laughs> oh the boy, yeah, election no um, when Andrew Shear was the leader. Uh, every campaign stop in Ontario that. Trudeau went to he 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 wasn't running against Andrew Shear he was running against Doug Ford yeah uh, like Doug Ford was the enemy 
And uh, that, you know, that played well for Ford, too. You know, we're going after Trudeau on the carbon tax and we're going after Trudeau on this, that and the other thing. Now it's like they're they, they're 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 best buddies. And that if well, you're and if you're the Ontario liberals like you're Stephen Del Duca, you're hoping you, you must have been hoping that, you know, Trudeau's going to be there for you and he can like give your campaign a lift and maybe some shine and maybe some star power, some appeal, because. Yeah, you know, Del Duca doesn't have it. Um, no, not he's a, at all. He's a smart guy. He's a smart guy. Don't get yeah, me for wrong. Sure. He's a he. he but it, and, and when he was in government, he was a real attack dog for the government. That's his reputation. Um, <laughs> to see, well, he was probably hoping see, and praying. You know, that, that to see Doug the truth. Would turn you know, down. Well, yeah, to see Trudeau, um, you know, being best buddies with Ford has just got to be killing Del Duca. Like, what are you doing to me, guy? What are you doing to me? Yeah, anyway. yeah absolutely. It's all about political survival, though, as individuals, right? Yeah. I think that's what our politics have become. It's political survival of, of each individual and <laughs> to be damned with the rest of you. So we interviewed a few people this week. The sixth wave is here. We had Dr. Manuel on the show yesterday. Yeah. Uh, the sixth wave of COVID is here. Overwhelming response, though, from, from the callers yesterday was we don't want um, any restrictions. Like, don't bring back capacity limits. There's no need to reimpose the mask mandate or anything like this. That was the response that I heard. What, what, right. what do you think, uh, yeah, I, I, you know what, I, I, I've been incredibly cautious. I, I'm still wearing my mask, but, you know, I, I think I agree with the majority of your callers. Is that um, did we lift the mask mandates too soon? Personally, I, I think so. I think okay. the only thing they can do now, Rob, is is continue to educate and and you know just. Uh, convincing people that you know continuing to wear your mask is the right way to because if they go backwards. Um, boy, oh boy, I, I just can't even see what, what's going to happen. They, they, they just can't go back to, to restrict. I mean, could they go back to mass mandates? Perhaps that's the only thing. I just don't see them able to go back to anything else. There, there can't be any more lockdowns. That's for sure. I just can't see them doing that so close to the election either. You know? No, no, that would be a disaster for the conservatives for sure. Yeah, okay. And Del Duca and, and Horvath will have to be careful as well. Right about what I they mean, demand. About what well, they demand. Well, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Wow, what an interesting time. All right, Derek. Thank you so much for today. I'll, I'll, I'll love having your perspective on things. I always a, appreciate. Yeah. Always appreciate talking to you, Rob. Yeah. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. That's Derek Fage. He's the host of Daytime Ottawa. Paxlovid. What is it? How do you get it? The therapy for COVID nineteen antiviral. Uh, Jen Belcher is a pharmacist and she'll uh, tell us all about that coming up next. Rob Snow Show City News. I'm Emily Bertrand, the owner of Royale Equestrian Center. Uh, this is Diamond. She's a 10 year old thoroughbred. She used to be a racehorse um, and then made the transition to a riding horse. She loves jumping and she's used for our more advanced students. So we started the farm 14 years ago um, with my mom and brother. My brother was actually driving by one day and saw the sign and we applied. There were 60 applicants and we got it. Um, when we first started, there was not very much here. So our property is about 25 acres and there was just this 100 year old barn. And from there we built onto it. We fixed up one stall at a time, one paddock at a time. We added one horse at a time and slowly it built into what it is today. Uh, every year we're improving and trying to continue to build. Um, and most recently we added two Shedra barns this year. I love horses. I've been obsessed with horses since I was a little girl. Uh, the first time I got to ride, I was four years old and I just loved it. My mom thought it was gonna be a phase and that phase never ended. I kept riding all through high school and then eventually, you know, started Royale Equestrian Center. It was my dream to always own a farm and to build a place that I could share my passion for horses with others and do the same thing for the kids that the horses did for me. So I absolutely love it. It's a dream come true. COVID hit, that was challenging. Um, I was pretty stressed, especially the first few months, trying to figure out how are we gonna navigate all of this. Our business is based on people coming in. 
Um, we don't make much revenue if there's nobody coming in to ride. Uh, so that was really challenging. And then the other aspect of it was how are we going to care for all these horses if we're fully shut down and there's no income coming in. Um, so we worked really hard. Some of our team were so kind to actually just come in and volunteer and help us out. And we made through it. You know, we got through it. It's been uh, hard and a lot of work, but um, it's also shown us how resilient we can be. So I'm, I'm happy with how we're coming out of COVID. Hopefully this is, you know, we're nearing the end of all the shutdowns, um, but we've, you know, survived it and, and now we're starting to thrive again, which is great. So we have a great team. We have about 14 coaches and then we have all our regular barn staff. We have our maintenance manager and crew. And if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be able to do this. It takes a huge amount of people. And then we also have a volunteer program. The volunteer program, it helps with us, especially with our beginner program. So they help with tacking up the horses and caring for the horses when we're really busy. And then they also get to gain some work experience. We take co-op students on. Um, we're quite a busy and vibrant place and it takes a lot of people to make it work. Even through to behind the scenes from our accountants, my family who are always stepping in to help out. Um, it's, it takes a small village. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News 1011 FM and 1310 AM. There is a, a therapy, a drug therapy that is approved to treat COVID-19, not a vaccine. It's called Paxlovid. It's been approved for use in Canada, but uh, getting it be after you've been prescribed it by a doctor is proving difficult for some. So uh, let's get more into this issue. Jen Belcher joins me, pharmacist and vice president of strategic initiatives at the Ontario Pharmacists Association. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, really nice to have your perspective on on this issue. Uh, what do you know about problems getting Paxlovid to patients who have been prescribed it? Yeah, right now it's been challenging because uh, there's fairly limited eligibility windows for people who um, would be eligible to receive the medication. Um, so when we look at the eligibility criteria, we're looking at people who are you know, compromised um, if they're unvaccinated and within a certain age group or demographic. And with this medication, there's a lot of drug-drug interactions um, that are complicated to manage, especially in these populations. So uh, what we're seeing is even among the people with confirmed COVID-19 cases, the number of people who are able to receive it, even though they're eligible, is fairly low. In addition, uh, I don't think a lot of people really understand how they could access the medication if they have a confirmed case and they might be eligible. Uh, so we're seeing a really small number of uh, courses of Paxlovid dispensed to this point in time. Uh, there has been limited availability of the drug, but as that's expanding, we need to do more to increase that access to people who would benefit from from the medication. Okay, uh, I'm j we're just going to put you on hold. We're having a, a a bit of a difficult time hearing you. Uh, maybe a speakerphone, maybe a bad uh, telephone connection, but it's very important information that you have to share. So um, we're just going to try and get a better connection. Our guest is Jen Belcher, a pharmacist and vice president of strategic initiatives with the Ontario Pharmacist Association. Uh, well, we're good. Uh, all right, let's try this again. Jen Belcher. My apologies. Oh, I'm sounding much better. Ah, okay. Excellent. All right. So uh, if you don't mind, well, I just want to back up a little bit here. So when, when it comes to this, is it is it an antiviral? Is that what it is? Is it fair to call it that? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's actually okay. a combination right. of two different antiviral medications that stop the virus from replicating in our body. So it helps our body take care of the infection before it has a chance to spread. Okay. And when you mean that there's a tight window, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? So people need to start the medication within five days of symptom onset. So a okay. uh, really tight timeline for when they need to start it in order for it to effective. Right. And it's only approved for certain segments of the population, high risk individuals Correct. i guess right yeah so we have you know compromised people people who are unvaccinated age 60 and over unvaccinated individuals 50 and over with one or more risk factors um so forth okay so what have been some of the obstacles that you've heard about 
I know uh, people are having a hard time figuring out where to go if they uh, think that they might be eligible for treatment. Once they get a positive test, even just getting that test in the first place can prove challenging because uh, we have limited eligibility on testing. So if you need a positive PCR test in order to qualify, being able to get that in the first place to be eligible for therapy uh, is a challenge for most people, as well as knowing what to do afterwards and being able to do that within the time frame that they need in order to start the drug um, has been challenging for people because right now uh, we're seeing most of the um, provision of the medication through clinical assessment centers uh, in the various different public health regions. And people can either call their primary care provider, call telehealth, or visit the, the assessment center. But right. I think general knowledge about what to do is, isn't really uh, well established out there either. Right, right. So, yeah, but, but, yeah, I guess the, the one of the problems is it's not enough to have a positive test, but there has to be a medical history taken, right, at one of these Correct. assessment centers to yeah. determine your eligibility. Yeah, and that medical history will involve um, assessing all the medications that you're currently on, as well as what conditions you have, and how well some of your key organs are functioning. So it's a pretty complicated process. Right, because, and I would assume because it's being prescribed to people who are in already um, high-risk categories, uh, as you said, there's, you know, you as a pharmacist, there's the potential for interactions there because people in high-risk categories would already be on, maybe, you know, one or maybe several medications already, right? So Absolutely, and this drug has a significant number of drug interactions. You know, it's higher than normal number of drug interactions that we need to look for. Um, so as pharmacists, uh, we're looking to be more involved in that process because um, the drug-drug interactions and management of them is something that is part of our core wheelhouse of uh, wheel, wheelhouse of clinical skills. Okay, so at the pharmacist uh, itself, at the uh, at the pharmacy itself, um, what is known about the actual supply of this drug right now? Yeah, so right now it's been um, limited based off of the deliveries to the federal government to date, but we know that there's going to be um, an imminent influx of more doses. So what we're hoping to see is that increase in patient eligibility so that um, that high-risk group gets expanded out for the types of people who could qualify for therapy. But it's, you, is it fair to call it limited right now? Yes, absolutely, that would be fair. Okay, so... A person could get prescribed the medication and even get the appropriate assessment, but still obtaining it from a pharmacy might prove challenging. Is that is that fair? Right, or? because right now it's not actually dispensed through most pharmacies. Um, typically to date, it's had to be per, um, procured through the clinical assessment centers, which, you know, there are maybe limited numbers. I'm, I'm out in the Kingston area, okay. and we've just moved down to one clinical assessment center for the entire... Um, health unit region. So it can be tough for people who live rurally or, or far from the assessment center as well, too. So and, the and to be able to get it from I, I don't expect you to know way. the answer to this, but how, yeah, but then, you know, assuming somebody can navigate all of that, then how many pharmacies in the Kingston area would you expect would even have the medication? Uh, currently, none. Um, so what none. we're advocating for, yeah, at the um, Pharmacy uh, Association here in Ontario is to bring community pharmacies into the loop on this. Uh, because right now it's provided through those assessment centers, not through pharmacies um, or through hospitals, but not through community pharmacies. So it's not like a regular prescription that you would to your pharmacist at your community pharmacy and have dispensed. Uh. So what we've been advocating for is a process whereby you could get your test, you could be assessed by the pharmacist, uh, perhaps even get your prescription from the pharmacist in their assessment of your case, and then actually have it dispensed all in one place. So we're, we're hoping that that access as the supply increases okay when do you expect the supply to increase should be in the coming weeks in the coming weeks I, you know because people you know, we've talked a lot about COVID-19 this week because you know wastewater samples are increasing and, and whatnot so it's top of mind again for a lot of people I think a lot of people are under the impression that um, well I can take Paxlovid now mm -hmm. but, it, but it's not that easy <laughs> At it's all, not that easy. Right? We, we, we need you to know. make it easier, especially with right. this sixth wave. Okay. Thank you so much. Very useful information. Surprising information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jen Belcher, pharmacist, vice president of strategic initiatives at the Ontario Pharmacist Association.
Talk back hour coming up right after the 10 o'clock news. It's a Friday free for all. I have a line for you at 750-1310. This is the Rob Snow Show City News. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. I love to make abundance boards. And why do I call them abundance boards? because they're an abundance of all the things that you love together. There's no rhyme or reason, there's no rules. It's literally about taking a whole bunch of different ingredients and making them into something that you love, that you can snack on. Maybe curl up on the couch and uh, have a snack night. Charcuterie is all about a meat plate. And antipasti is all about a little bit of meat, a little bit of fruit, and a little bit of snack that you might have at the beginning of a meal, like an appetizer. I like to take all of these concepts and kind of mesh them together. It's kind of like a work of art because you're creating something delicious, but you're also creating something that looks super fancy, like from a gourmet style restaurant, but just using simple things you have. Ottawa's a very political city and it's not just political with the people in parliament. You got street politics, you got business politics, you got basketball politics, and if you don't know how to navigate the systems, you get left behind. I did. They thought I went crazy. They thought I was dead. I was. But it's never too late to heal, to rebuild, to reinvent yourself. Present. W1310 AM in Ottawa and CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 1st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, two degrees, three in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Pope Francis issued a historic apology to Canada's Indigenous people this morning for the church's role in Canada's residential school system. City News reporter Laura Carney joins us with the details. Today's meeting at the Vatican, a culmination of a week of meetings with Métis, Inuit and First Nations delegates. And I want to say to you with all my heart I am very sorry. That historic papal apology, one that Indigenous peoples had hoped to hear. Pope Francis also begging forgiveness and says he felt indignation and shame for the abuses suffered by Indigenous peoples at the hands of Catholic educators. Sorrow and shame for the role that a number of Catholics, particularly those with educational responsibilities, have had in all these things that wounded you. Phil Montaigne, former National Chief of Assembly of First Nations, spoke outside the Vatican. He even went beyond what I hoped to hear from him when he talked about feeling shame and guilt. Pope Francis also announced he'd come to Canada. Indigenous leaders hope he will offer an apology here as well. Laura Carney, City News. Now, Métis National Council President Cassidy Caron sat with residential school survivor Angie Creerer. And when Angie and I were sharing a book and reading the book together, I pointed out the words, I am sorry. She broke down into tears and it was so moving because I know how important that is to her. And I know how important those words are going to be to our survivors back at home. Which is why we will continue to advocate for Pope Francis to share those, those words, those sentiments, what he's learned and what he's heard from us back on our homelands. Now, Francis also asked for God's God's forgiveness. And while the plans are in the works for a trip to Canada sometime this year, some feel it will be July, but no firm date has been set.
City News Time 1004. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Well, after a brief warm up, it's back to colder air and some snow at times. No major accumulations, if anything, just some flurries. Already reached our high for the day. For the afternoon, we'll sit at about two, minus four for the low. And for the weekend, sun and cloud Saturday, but back to some flurries or showers for Sunday. For today, the high already reached for the afternoon, near two. And right now it is two degrees in Ottawa, three degrees in Smith Falls. The misery in Mariupol continues with Ukraine now claiming Russian forces have seized food supplies that were intended for the people trapped there. The Ukrainian government says the forces blocked 45 buses that had been sent to evacuate civilians from the besieged port city of Mariupol and only 631 people were able to get out of the city in private cars. Deputy Prime Minister Oryna Varevshuk added late Thursday that 12 Ukrainian buses with humanitarian aid had left Melitopol for Mariupol, but the Russian forces had stopped them, seizing the 14 tons of food and medicines on board. I'm Charles Duladesma. And the husband of one of 22 people killed in a mass shooting in Nova Scotia almost two years ago says the Commission of Inquiry has failed to properly scrutinize evidence or ask probing questions about the RCMP. Nick Beaton believes there were a lot of missing, a lot missing from yesterday's proceedings, which focused on the second day of the killings. Latest documents to be released describe tense and tragic moments as the RCMP officers and then distraught family members arrived at places where their loved ones had been killed. For example, the inquiry heard no ambulance was called as Heather O'Brien lay dying because of the risk of an active shooter. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Continues with a Friday free-for-all. It's our favorite hour of the week around here. We don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. We just do our best to roll with it. At 750-1310. We usually talk about things that have been in the news because we're all news junkies around here. We are hopelessly addicted to the news. Uh, but whatever, it doesn't have to be in the news. Maybe it's something you think should be in the news. Whatever it happens to be, within reason, we're uh, usually down with it. 750-1310. 613-750-1310. I would be curious to hear this morning from anyone who happened to attend the Pierre Polyev anti-carbon tax rally yesterday at the Infinity Center. What was that like if you happened to be there? I was not there. Uh, I'd love to get a recap from you, uh, like a review a review. What did you think of that event? What was the mood like? Why did you go? What? How, how, how do you think he did? Man, he is pulling in the crowds. Polyev, no doubt about it. Wherever he goes, no matter the time of day, he's getting the crowds. And um, based on the reports I've read this morning, it was a large and enthusiastic crowd last night. Good recap from Politico. I um, I subscribe to Politico's morning newsletter. It's, it's really good most of the time. Let me read a little bit of it here. Uh, I noticed Politico calls it a freedom rally, uh, the Polyev Freedom Rally. Freedom, freedom rally. Uh, quote, Politico's account of uh, last night's event, the Polyev event, quote, Pierre Polyev packs a room with nearly a thousand freedom-loving supporters. They feel freedom from covid as evidenced by a noticeable lack of masks in the room. Freedom from government, as evidenced by the booing for vaccine mandates. Freedom from anyone seen to be opposed to freedom. They gather in a ballroom on a little more than 24 hours' notice to cheer on their man. There's no denying it. Polyev's movement, which draws hundreds wherever he goes, has arrived. Andrew Shear is Polyev's hype man, priming the crowd for the man of the hour. Polyev's wife is the penultimate act. She tells her family's story of immigration from Venezuela as political refugees in the 90s. She had something that might make Polyev's critics bristle. He says the same things privately as he does publicly. The main event... Polyev enters from the back of the room to chants of freedom. 
He hops on stage and unfurls a stump speech still in development, but practiced enough for the eager crowd. It takes a certain talent to whip up a frenzy over rhetorical attacks on regulatory gatekeepers, but they howl. Polyev even gets a collective cheer for a Magna Carta shout-out. <laughs> his many, many critics will rail against his allergy to nuance. He doesn't distinguish between federal and provincial and even municipal jurisdiction, they'll rightly say. He ignores the global forces that play a serious role in inflation, they'll point out. But the people in the room have no interest in something as trivial as nuance. They hear what they want to hear, and they love every second of it. Spotted at the rally, former Stephen Harper Chief of Staff Ray Novak, former Harper Policy Director Rachel Kern, sheer side a, a sheer aide Kenzie Potter, and a whack of MPs. A whack of MPs. Biggest cheer of the night, defund the CBC. Tiniest cheer of the night, I will reject a China-style crackdown on cryptocurrency. So that's one account uh, of last night's Polyev rally from one news organization. But if you were there, I, I'm just curious, you know, just curious what you think of it. Uh, Michelle, Ottawa South. Michelle, good morning here on City News. Good morning, Rob. I was there. You were there. Okay, read, all right. All I right. read that same article this morning and uh, very well written, but so insulting, so cleverly insulting. Eh? Oh, really? Like okay. Lowell says, all a bunch of knuckle-dragging Neanderthals. I have a different take on it. Okay. Um, first of all, I believe there would have been way more people there because they were turning away. There was the story inside was, you know, there was hundreds of cars outside that couldn't find parking. It was packed, and yeah. people were very, very happy and excited to have somebody they could stand behind and support. And to all the people that couldn't make it in, purchase a membership, buy it through Polyev's office. Money well spent. So there were people so, who couldn't get in. It was that crowded, they had to turn people away? Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh really? Sure. Okay. It was packed. Wow. So, and people were happy and uh, young families all kinds of faces all kinds of people so yeah. you know he has a wide was sport. it let me ask you this let me ask you this and be honest with me was it ethnically diverse well i mean yes yes it was yeah. if you consider i mean you know what are we going to count how many different color faces no 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 we saw? But, you know, there was representation were there new canadians from, there were there new canadians there were new canadians there yeah. and they were also smiling so okay all right the, so, but I would just say that his wife opened the rally by telling us about who they were and where they came from, and that Pierre was born to a young mother and had been very blessed to be raised by a great family, and that she herself was a political refugee from Venezuela. And she repeated several times that gas is not, an assess is not a luxury, but a necessity. And, you know, I, I take exception to people. When somebody's come here as a refugee, you know, and, and I like Derek, but I heard Derek speaking with you before and saying how these politicians are out of touch and how they don't know. They weren't always politicians. They had lives. They know full well how difficult it is to meet your budget, to, you know, accommodate your family, to be able to provide for your children's activities, so on and so on. And you know what else, Rob? I happen to drive a diesel. So I am like, wow, ax that tax, get rid of it. And the reason I bought the diesel was because I bought a good quality used vehicle that had a diesel engine because a diesel engine will last you for many, many years if you maintain it. So it was on my part, a good investment on the highway. It uses less gas. And now I'm looking at it like it's just going to be a trophy somewhere because I filled up the other day was $2 a liter. Yep. And that was the cheapest I could find. Yeah, it's like it's 207 around the corner from here. Yeah, it's yep. crazy. All right, Michelle, good account. Thank you. Oh, oh, what, oh sorry. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, quickly. Yeah. There's so many things. I, I would like to say well we don't, um, we, we've got oh, jam phone lines, lines. So. one of the best lines that Pierre said last night was, if you're not sitting at the table with Justin you're on the menu and that's oh. the truth <laughs> okay. all right okay oh that's a pretty good line yeah that is a good line okay if you're not at the table you're on the menu that's a good line Chris uh, Blackburn Hamlet Chris 
Yeah, Rob. Hi, Chris. Um, I was there. Oh, you were there? Okay. You were at the event. Uh, I was actually surprised at how far I had to park away just to, to get there. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, All I, right. I had a dinner so what time, what time of day did this start uh, last thing? It was announced to start at 6.30. Yeah. Uh, when I got into the building, um, people were there, but it didn't really get underway until about 7.30. Okay. So, which is actually okay because it gave people a chance to talk and network, so nobody seemed to mind right. you know, the hour wait. And okay. it gave them more of a chance to get more people in the room. There was still a room for more people to come in, but um, it was still a, a pretty impressive crowd. Uh, your previous caller kind of touched on most of the highlights. Derek Sage, you were talking to him, and he was talking about you know divisive speech. There, there was nothing in that speech last night that would have been divisive. Uh, you could have brought your best liberal or NDP friend and sat them down and say, listen to this speech and tell me what he said that was divisive. There was, there was nothing divisive in there at all. Okay, was, all right. You know, anybody could uh, in, relate to what he was saying. And what was really impressive is after the event was over, he went behind the screen so people could meet and greet him. And I actually took a picture of the lineup so I could show my friends. You wouldn't believe the length of that lineup just to meet him. Like really? They're, they're probably really? still there right now. Really? <laughs> I was just like, wow, look at that line. I've never seen such a lineup, even for a star athlete. Like, how many people would you say were in that line? Like, 100 people? Or in, really? in the line? Yeah. Oh, uh, about three or, about 300 in the line just to meet him afterwards. Afterwards? Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was incredible. I have a picture to show it, to prove it. Yeah. It, was, it was just like, I've never seen that for a politician before. Just lined up. I don't know how long it took the last person to get there. But it, it must have been like an hour at least, just to just to meet him if you're at the end of the line. Holy cow! It was okay. it was really incredible. Oh, all right. Okay. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for the account. Isn't that something? Eh? Polyev. Holy cow! All right, Roger in Drummond. Roger. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Roger. It's pretty hard to top those last two calls there. It's kind of exciting, you know, it uh, bodes well for the future, I hope. I hope he can build beyond the 32% base, and uh, maybe he can, you know. Well, but, Rob, yeah. uh, I want to talk about uh, a few things, and yeah. one of them is, uh, like, you know, we talked the other day about the cost of living. Yeah. Now, it's, it's getting very difficult. Every time you go to the, to the grocery store or get fuel or whatever, it's getting pretty scary. And, and for people that uh, who are living on the edge, I don't know how many people can can sustain this much longer. But one of the questions I'd like to to ponder is, uh, and and with the audience is, uh, what kind of uh, uh, a democratic government uh, who has uh, a country that's full of resources and ha- should have energy energy security, uh, and part of the solution, you know, with uh, Europe, you know, getting off of Russian oil and natural gas, like uh, Joe Biden, there he. Uh, He's going to open up the taps there, uh, a million barrels a day for the next 180 days. And uh, last night on the news, I was listening to him, and he was saying that I hope uh, like-minded uh, uh, democracies that have an opportunity to yeah, add um, more to the system yeah. to do it, you know. And he's kind of pointing a finger to Canada. Well, you know what? He had his chance to get Canadian oil. 800,000 barrels a day. We were re- you know, ready, willing, and able to send him. Yeah, I understand that. the Keystone too, XL. And what, what was one of the first things that that guy did? This is what drives me crazy about Joe Biden. I get, okay, working class hero, worried about the working class, worried about the price of gas, worried about the cost of living. I get all of that. Yes, when he, but, when he, but come on. Um, we're, we're your best friend. We're your closest neighbor. And there's a pipe right there ready to go. Yes, and that, you know what the problem yeah. is too, Rob? I think it's maybe it's because of the type of leadership we have. I mean, this uh, Mr. Trudeau talks about all uh, full of platitudes, but there's no substance to anything. You know, when he's asked about uh, to, to different leaders in Europe, would you help us uh, maybe get off of Russian oil and be part of the solution? He never gave a straight answer. He never gave a straight answer about whether we should have our 2% for NATO, finally, you know, for our military, you know. But to perpetrate this on the people of this country that are suffering so much, Rob, look at all of our institutions. Institutions that every from every level of government that has to rely on uh, either natural gas or something to heat sure. those buildings that us taxpayers pay yep. for, yep. and then all the charities that are having to pay all the energy, and then to, you know like Meals on Wheels, like my sister-in-law does in Cornwall, and she has to use her gas. Like how much more can she afford? And everybody, yep. what kind of a government yep. does that to its people, Rob? Yeah, good point, Roger. Great points as always. Thanks for your call, Roger. Great to hear from you. Seven five zero thirteen ten. It's the Friday free for all on the Rob Snow Show. On City News. 
So the Women's Business Network is um, a volunteer-run association that achieves its uh, its uh, strategy and vision by supporting women to achieve their success on their own terms by providing development opportunities, valuable connections within the organization itself, and it, it facilitates member access um, to growth within their business and careers. I mentioned the absence, the two-year absence of the uh, Business Woman of the Year Awards. Uh, you know, obviously difficult, Mira, but certainly an opportunity to, to work on some new things. Tell us what, what, you've, what you've got planned, what you worked on. Yeah, we really missed putting on the BYAs uh, for the last two years because of COVID. It, it also was unfortunate that we couldn't celebrate the women that were having such a huge impact on our um, community in Ottawa. So we're really glad that they're back now. Um, as you know, that they've been around since 1983. Mm -hmm. They are uh, a purpose to celebrate the achievements, the professional expertise, and the leadership of all of the outstanding women we have in the National Capital Region. And for the first time this year in 2022, we've introduced two new categories, one being the Lifetime Achievement Award and the other one being the, uh, the Community Champion Award. Okay, yeah, and let, let's break it down even further because, uh, as I mentioned, there's a there, there's different categories, and then of course different awards within categories. Uh, tell us about some of the returning categories and some of the other awards as well. So the two returning categories that we're bringing back are actually the entrepreneur and the enterprise leaders. Those are, are very popular in our community. They draw a, a significant amount of nominations um, and, and they do get a lot of attention because it's very common um, that we take the opportunity that we want to celebrate the entrepreneurs in our community, especially after the two years yeah. of being through what they've been through. Okay. Right. So we're, we're looking for nominees of, um, of owners who have significant impact on their businesses that have seen strong growth in the last little while. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did do to revamp this award was we dissected it into three subcategories based on the term that the individuals have been in business for. So you've got from startups that have been around for one to three years, then we've got the emerging entrepreneurs three to seven and the established entrepreneurs for seven years and above. So there's really going to be three cat three awards or three uh, winners um, within the entrepreneur category itself. And then we've got the Enterprise Leader Award that's also come back. And this is an opportunity for organizations to nominate individuals within their, um, well, their, their, their business uh, um, that display exceptional leadership attributes, positively impact the environment. On the Rob Snow Show your say and call now 613-750-1310 yeah friday free for all rob stone show thinking a lot about my buddy pierre bork today uh pierre passed away last year of course he loved april fool's day he loved april fool's day uh and always had a good one at bork.com no better uh than his April Fool's Day joke about the retirement of, of Paul Martin that actually moved the Canadian dollar, or like it moved the dollar. I, uh, the Globe and Mail still has an account on, on its website about it. Uh, quote, an April Fool's Day joke helped sink the loony yesterday after a fake story saying Finance Minister Paul Martin was leaving politics to breed cattle and ducks was posted on a website. The dollar fell to 62.41 cents U.S., as North American markets opened after the Easter holiday, it ended at 62.55. That's when our, cur when our currency used to be 62 cents. Observers said the joke item was a contributing factor. The report about Mr. Martin's pending departure carried on the political gossip website Bork said the finance minister would resign his seat and that an official announcement was expected yesterday. It said Mr. Martin will retire to a quieter life outside the limelight to devote greater time to his wife and a burgeoning hobby interest in the breeding of prize Charlet cattle and handsome fawn runner ducks. <laughs> fawn runner ducks, which he planned to show this fall at the Brome Lake and Havelock fairs. Advisors to Martin denied there was any truth to the story. Quote, there's absolutely nothing to this. Spokesman Brian Guest said. Yeah, Brian Guest. 
The website's author, Pierre Bork, said he was taken aback by the reaction. It's April 1st, after all. The ducks were the telltale sign. I oh, love it. Uh, don't you love it? That's a, that was a good one. John in Kempville. John. Hey, Rob. Love hey, your show as usual. Thank you. Um, I just want to raise the issue that I think is a huge issue for all of us and all of the issues that you talk about is misinformation. Yeah. Just how much misinformation there is out there and who is spreading the misinformation. You know, for instance, I'll give you a couple examples quickly. Um, if you go to Maxime Bernier's uh, site, it is completely chock full with misinformation that's not fact checked, that is completely biased, and it's brainwashing people and they're lapping it up. Um, perfect example is. You know, the speeches that were given by the EU members criticizing Trudeau and, you know, the headline on all of these uh, on these uh, Facebook pages and social media is how world leaders are all against Trudeau and calling him a tyrant. Well, that's not true. There was a small number of pretty radical, I'll call them alt-right politicians in Europe that shot their mouths off. And, of course, the uh, media, Rebel News, all this right-wing stuff hmm. just spreads that out there. I think it's a real problem. Now, of course, okay, okay. We, don't, we don't want censorship. That's fine. No. But what I think, I think the issue here is education and awareness. What do you think of that? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, for the most part, it is a big problem. Misinformation, disinformation. Um, the, you know, the problem is how you go about combating that kind of thing. Well, I think we combat right. it by being very vocal about encouraging people to think critically. And right. critical thought yeah. is not hard. Critical thought is what you do every day on your show. You're, Try to. You're a, master, you're a master of it, right? You ask Try questions. To. Try to. You keep yeah. asking questions until you get the confirmation that the resource is reliable, is credible. And if it's not, you call it out. So okay. why are we doing that? Like, we're not stupid people. Well, you are. That. You are right now. As you said, I am right now. I guess what, what, what troubles me is do I want, say, do I want someone at Twitter, whoever's behind the curtain at Twitter, or someone at Facebook, do I want those people, like, this is what troubles me. Do I want those people to be the arbiters of the truth? Not really. Um, do I, do I, I, do I you know, do I want the, 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 Trudeau government to regulate the internet even more. No, I'm, I'm I'm very, very worried about what they have planned for internet. I'm very worried about that as too, because freedom of speech is enshrined in our constitution, in our charter of freedoms and rights. Yeah, Yeah. it's very clear when you can limit that. Hate speech is one of the only real limitations on. Yeah, and it's not even you know in in our charter, it's not even speech; it's expression, which is even kind of like beyond speech, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So I agree with you. We do not want these these mega corporations setting the agenda, and we certainly don't want our democratically elected governments. But they do need to enforce the law, And, and I'll bring that to my next point. This whole, this whole craziness about Randy Hillier, because the buzz about him being arrested, and I can tell you many of us were instrumental in making sure the police had the evidence of what the crimes he was breaking, because he was, he was really radical about it and very vocal, and he completely self-incriminated himself. It was really crazy. But anyway, There was a time, there was a point during the protest on the Hill, I thought he was going to incite a riot up there. He was trying to. That's what he wanted to do. And that Crazy. needs to be stopped. So that yeah. this is why he, I think he should do prison time. I doubt he will. But in any case, you know, the misinformation about the charges, like, for instance, Section 464 is a mischief, mischief charge. Mischief is a serious crime in Canada. You can go to jail for mischief. You can. You can. Depending on what it yeah. is. You can. So uh-huh. this misinformation about how it's politically motivated, Trudeau's a tyrant, we need to fight back sure, against sure. that vocally well, I mean, and, in, and I, I, I'm sure in in his head now, he's probably reveling in it because he, it will make him like a martyr to whatever cause he wants to to stand up for. Uh, well, John, I, I got to run, John. I got to run, John. I got to run. Sorry, sorry. The news is coming up. I should get the news on time uh, at least one time this week. 1028, Andrew's standing by with the news, and then we're right back on the phones. Nicola in uh, Lauren Yell, Brian in Ashton. Two lines available there for it. It's Friday free-for-all. Pretty wide open here today at 750-1310 on City News.
I'm Daniela Lard, and I am a proud Ottawa born and raised singer songwriter, and I'm part of Encore Ottawa 3. I think that this is the first time that I have unveiled a set of music that's all new music. I'm usually pulling from some of my older projects like Chameleon and Passing Notes and trying to feature songs from both of those, but the set you're about to hear has been all written within the last year. So I'm really excited to share that with Ottawa and share that with the world. Sometimes it feels What does it mean? Well, firstly, I'm seeing friends that I haven't seen in two years, so that is kind of stabbing me in the heart a little bit, but I'm also just so happy to be able to make art with all of these friends again. And what it means being in a venue like this for a local artist, I mean, Centerpoint Theatre is <laughs> the premiere. I've been treated like an absolute rock star from the moment I just kind of knocked on the door and said, hey, can I unload my gear? Uh, everybody's so helpful and you're just used to kind of dragging all your stuff around and it's such a hard business to be in and this is a dream come true for any local artist who gets to participate in a series like this and to also have access to an incredible film and audio crew. It's the dream. I'm too small to have I really hope you like the music and just come and see all of the talent that Ottawa has to offer. For local news in Ottawa and the Valley, this is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 1st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, two degrees in Smith Falls, three. And here's what's making news this hour. Pope Francis delivered a heartfelt apology to Canada's Indigenous people for what they endured in the residential school system. He made the apology during an address to dozens of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people at the Vatican this morning. The Pope says it is chilling to think of determined efforts to instill a sense of inferiority, to rob people of their cultural identity, to sever their roots and to consider all the unresolved trauma that has been intergenerational. The Pope says he will be coming to Canada. No firm date, though, has been released. Gas is a little more expensive today, and not only an increase due to the ongoing war in Ukraine, but also the carbon tax. It added 2.2 cents a litre as of this morning, April 1st, across Ontario and several other provinces. Public health measures in Ontario are not going to be reintroduced. The health minister says with rising cases of COVID in this sixth wave that was not unexpected and the government will continue following scientific advice but further measures don't appear to be needed right now city news time at 10 32 i'm andrew boyle for news anytime follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca talk back hello on the rob snow show the phone lines are open at 613-750-1310 now the rob snow show continues with a friday free-for-all second half i love to talk about the carbon tax today it's up yeah 50 dollars a ton now 2.2 cents a liter on the price of gasoline you're good for it right you're good for it the government still insists, even despite the latest report from the PBO on the matter, the, the Trudeau government continues to insist, whatever you pay in carbon tax, you, yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to get it back. Okay, most of you, leave, you'll even get more money back. Uh, that's what makes it, it's the best tax ever, okay? It's a money maker for you, best tax ever. I, I put that to, to people earlier in the week. What I got back was not a lot of people are buying that line, but that's their line and they're sticking to it. What astonishes me, I guess, is it's just the disconnect, the disconnect uh, between Trudeau and the middle class and those working hard to join it. The cost of living is the issue right now. I mean, there's another poll out today that backs that, that up. Ipsos did a poll for Global News. Uh, Global News reports, David Aiken reports this morning for Global. Ipsos has 1,500 Canadians online survey between March 11th and 16th. List your three priorities for the budget. 
a majority, 53%, listed help with the soaring costs of everyday needs due to inflation as one of their top three priorities, followed with 45% listing lowering taxes as a top priority. Well, taxes just went up yesterday. 40% told the poster greater investments in health care ought to be a priority. Daryl Bricker of Ipsos said the mood of the country on the eve of the budget is significantly different than other years. In other years, climate change, green infrastructure, indigenous reconciliation, and other themes often associated with the Trudeau government's Build Back Better messaging were higher priorities. Those issues now have a lower priority. Quote from Bricker, what we're seeing in people is much more focus on the day-to-day affordability of their lives. It aligns with a lot of pessimism coming out this time from the pandemic and the real belief that we're now suffering the personal economic consequences associated with the pandemic. So, uh, end quote, the cost of living, right? Cost of living, cost of living, inflation, inflation, inflation. You hike, and I hike the carbon tax 25% now. You're out of touch, in my opinion. Just out of touch. Uh, Lauren Yell, Nicola. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it's not an April Fool's joke. The no. price of alcohol is going up automatically. No longer debated in Parliament, apparently. Oh, yes. The, um, what's that called? There's a term yeah. for that. And the carbon tax, of course. No, accelerator. <laughs> it's an accelerator or something yeah. like that. It's called. Yeah, I want to talk about escalator. Because, Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody is thrilled about the money, and I'm a former educator. Um, okay. And it, the money all goes to nonprofit. So it means less choice. And women who want to stay home and just, you know, look after a few kids or immigrants don't have diplomas. They want to look after a few kids. They have to compete against this subsidized uh, daycare. Yeah, and there's going to be a rush into those, right? Which will yeah. create, if it replicates what happened in Quebec, it's going to create a total shortage of space. Well, and the shortage, uh, shortage and, of educators. Know, There's a shortage yeah, already of yeah, educators. Yeah, yeah. And a, and a uh-huh. long wait list. I mean, the advice in Quebec right now is if you want to get daycare for your child in Quebec, you have to sign up when you're pregnant. Yeah, and the ratios are terrible in Quebec. They're the worst in the country. It's like one to five for, for infants and one for 20 uh, for five-year-olds. Okay. And the, the, the square footage is really bad, too. Uh, but anyway, um, I also want to talk about the... Um, but the amazing the thing is, though, party. Nicola, the amazing thing about the the way that daycare yeah. issue has evolved is you right. know, this used to be like a big issue for conservatives, right? Yeah. Fought fought elections over this, you know, beer and popcorn elections, right? Yeah. That you know we're not, we, you know, we don't want the government taking care of our our kids and all this kind of stuff. And what we'll do is we'll send parents money. Um, where have all those conservatives gone? Um, like <laughs> well, Jason, Jason, coming, so uh, like Jason, Ke- you know, Jason Kenny, yeah. Scott Moe, Doug yeah. Ford, <laughs> uh, Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick. They, they all signed. They all money. signed the deal. They all signed the deal, right? So well, Ford's not going to turn it down right before an election. Come on. <laughs> no, but but what, well, yeah, but Jason Kenny doesn't have to go to the electorate until next year. Right. Uh-huh. So why did he sign it? I don't know. All right. Or Scott Moe or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Scott Moe just won an election. Yeah. yeah. Has a majority anyway, I government. wanted to talk about the new blue party we're having their conference. The and new, I, I listened wait, to wait. them last night. Okay. New blue. I don't know my, much yeah. about that one. Is <laughs> that, that provincial? Uh, or? Guy, Jim uh, Kara or something. Rather. Oh, Kara <laughs> Giannis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and Belinda, 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 no, Brenda, uh, his wife. Uh, but anyway, I heard last night from them that... Uh, that uh, the PC party no longer has nomination meetings. It's all picked by Ford. Oh, yeah? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. real real democratic. <laughs> okay, well. I know, yeah. He's on so, cruise uh, control right now, though, Nicola. Cruise control. That? Majority government for Ford. He's on cruise control, according to the polls. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder, are you going to interview anybody from the party? The, the What's it called again? The blue party? The new, new blue. New blue, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Man, I, I suppose. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, I mean, what chance do they have, right? Oh, I know, but, uh, you know, she's the only one that and stood up in the legislature for some of these things that Ford brought in and uh, voted against. Like I what? I think it's good to, like what? Good to have a, 
Well, I can't remember them all. There's something lately about the a women something or other that she was voting against. Okay, see, you don't even know what they stand for. Come on, Nicola. I'm sorry? You don't even know what they stand for. Well, I do, but I mean, I haven't followed every vote all in the right. legislation. Okay, all right, I got to go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, Bye. good enough. Bye. Yeah. I mean, this week on the child care deal, it's like a sea change. Um, I'll be interested to see how Polyev handles this, if he's the front runner. Um you know, if Kenny signs onto it, Mo signs onto it, Higgs signs onto it, Four signs onto it. I mean, is is Polly going to be like this conservative outlier who's saying no, 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 we're not going to have ten dollar a day childcare? It's going to be interesting. This may really box in Polyev on that issue. Uh, Brian in Ashton, Brian. Hey, Rob. Yeah, hi, Brian. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I like Pierre. He's a. Uh... He tells it like it is. There's absolutely no disinformation from Pierre. It's all facts. All facts. Um, okay. Everybody claims that he's divisive and he's he's aggressive. He, no, he just well, one, he doesn't tolerate fools very gladly. Right. And and two is he doesn't eat a bovine excrement. Okay. He calls it out, and he's been great at calling out why the cost of living has gone up because of the carbon tax. And the Liberals keep saying that, no, it won't go up because you get this money back, you get more right. than you pay back. It, it's not, you, it's but you, come on, come on, come on. You know, the, the, it, it's not just because of the carbon tax. That's not no. the only reason there's inflation, right? And everything that uses is made uses right. carbon okay. to make it. Joe Biden, uh, uh, come on, Brian, smarten up. Joe Biden doesn't have a carbon tax. The inflation rate in the United States is even higher than it is in Canada. How do you explain that? Yeah. yeah. Come on. Come on. You can do better than that. Uh, Marie in the West End. Marie. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi, Marie. Uh, I just wanted to uh, to try uh, chime in a little bit on this uh, what I call and many call the NDP liberal um, co- coalition. Coalition, call yes, the supply anyway, and confidence I, agreement. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what I don't understand. Okay, okay, you know, like we're we're the deficit is really high. We're we're just adding to it with everything else. And as Trudeau said one time, what did he say? Uh, deficits take care of themselves that's okay the budget will balance itself the budget will balance that's that's what he said yes and uh, what i don't understand i know like Singh, you know he wants his farmer care and he wants his agri care and that stuff and it's going to cost a lot of money and that's great and the daycare program that's fine but what i don't understand with with Singh, and maybe you can chime in a little bit i don't understand how he says we're doing all of this for canadians we're doing that for canadians whatever but still he is now going to support no matter what the liberals come out with. Yeah. You know what I'm... Are you getting my... Sure, sure. I mean, well, you know, what happens if there's another weed charity type scandal or another, you know, Jody Wilson-Raybould SNC-Lavalin type thing? That's right. Are they going to prop up the liberals for the next three years if something like that happens? Exactly. Exactly. I was talking to one fellow yesterday. I do an outreach at our church, and and he was saying, like, he doesn't understand how Singh could even do this because maybe that's the only way he wants to get what he wants, but uh, we'll see what comes in the budget, which he has to support no matter what's in it now. And he says he doesn't, but he's not going to bring down the government, I'm sure. He believes there's going to be this great payoff at the end, and, and New Democrats will be be rewarded for delivering the this expansion of social welfare and dental care and uh, yes, and pharmacare. Right. They're not going to get the credit. They're you're not right. going to get the credit. I you, just, uh, um, I you know, they I, like, for example, if you go back, you know, Tommy Douglas is there fighting, right? He's fighting in Saskatchewan for Medicare, takes the fight nationwide f- for for Medicare. But in the end, it was Mike Pearson's government that passed Medi- Medicare. And the, and then exactly. when when he stepped aside, we had Trudeau mania, and you know what, whatever it was, sixteen years of liberal government after that. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It, it somehow doesn't make sense. Yeah. And the other thing is, this young, this older man said to me yesterday. He said, 
how can we forget everything that this government has done, Trudeau especially, like all the uh, ethic scandals and the whole bit? It's not even brought up anymore. And he, a lot of people like myself, maybe because I'm an older conservative or whatever, I don't understand how you can literally support somebody like that. And But anyway, I just wanted to get your opinion because I really enjoy your opinions on uh, well, what's going to happen I, after this. I think... Mr. Singh is accomplishing the ultimate goal for Mr. Trudeau, which was to completely envelop the New Democrats. Well, that's well said. You know, I, I think I think I've had this kind of crazy theory. A lot of people think in 2015 that that was kind of like a comeback for the Liberal Party and a comeback for the Trudeau name, and maybe in part it was, but what it really was was kind of the first election of a new Democrat government. A lot of people think, you know, Trudeau is the heir to Pierre. I don't think so. I think he was the heir to Jack Layton. I do, too. Yeah. I do. I agree. Yeah. If you think, thank you, Marie. If you think back to 2011, right, the Liberals were in nowhere land. There was a big orange wave, and then... You know, unfortunately, Jack Layton passed away, and I think a lot of people on the left were were still looking for that dynamic, uh, charismatic, kind of new left type leader who promoted things like a you know a price on carbon and um, legal marijuana, these sorts of things. And you know, I think it's quite by design that that, that Gerald Butts and uh, Trudeau took that party totally to the left and and coalesced that non-conservative universe. It was, you know, and it's served them well. They won three elections. And the last one, they only needed 32% of the vote to do it. Myrna in Ottawa. Myrna. I'm calling about the good old carbon tax. The good old carbon tax. I went last night to Pierre's uh, Axe the Tax. It was oh, yeah? It was a little rally. It was kind of interesting. Well, I heard it wasn't that little. <laughs> no, it was big. It was, yeah, very surprised. Right. It was, and anyway, it was great. He came out really energized. Yeah. Uh, he spoke well. He's funny. It was, um... It was quite endearing, but what I really want to call about, which I brought with me last night, but I didn't get to talk to anybody about it, was my January Enbridge gas bill. Okay. I paid $33.96 in carbon tax, another $23.41 in HST, which is $57.37, off a bill that's $203. So 25%... 25% of your bill is taxes. Yeah. How is that sustainable? Well, and I ask everybody, I said, have you looked at your January bill just just by chance, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no. They just pay them. They don't even look at them anymore. And, and like, it's, it's the only place where you actually can see what the carbon tax is charging. Right. And we're two little people in a small little bungalow. Um, you know, in January, I have no choice but to turn you the You've got to heat your on. home, right? You have to heat your home. And what are my alternatives? So I don't understand where they think we're supposed to go in 10 years' time. Well, in 10 years, yeah. that's going to be $170. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it'll be 170 Well, in, in eight years, it'll be $170 by the year 2030, the carbon tax. Just, just that on one month bill? Like, this is one month bill. It's. No, oh, I'm t- saying it's $170 a ton. I the can't, car- oh, yeah. yeah, right. I know. Yeah, so yeah. you kind of do the math. Anyway, I just wish people would understand that. And we're not getting the money back, as you say. You don't think you're... They uh, say you're getting every dollar you spend in carbon tax, you're getting. Well, let's start keeping track of it. There should be an app for that so that we can... Not only that, Myrna, not only that, you're probably better off at the end of the year. That's <laughs> what they say. It's a moneymaker for you. You yeah. should... You should Crank up the thermostat. Maybe that would be like winning the lottery, Mer. Well, anyway, I don't. <laughs> I would like to keep a little bit it's of the so money that I work so hard to make yeah, and you in my it. pocket and choose what I would like to do with it. And if I'd like to take a vacation in my car, I would hope that it's not going to cost me a gazillion dollars. Shame on you. Myrna, thank you for your call. Be take right care, back. Rob. Yep, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 1048. Still time for some calls here. Friday free for all. Yeah, the carbon tax went up in Chicago. They're giving away gas for free. (laughs) A little more on that story coming right up on City News.
Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Yeah, carbon tax, that was a hot issue all week. Went up today. Officially $50 a ton. Um, just unbelievable. I mean, there's Joe Biden. Has spent a lifetime in the Democratic Party. You know, building this reputation as a, you know, a guy who fights for the working class. And now he's the president of the United States. Not a very popular one. Um, because of the rising cost of living. So what did he do yesterday? He ordered a massive release of oil from the United States Strategic Petroleum Reserve, hoping it will do something to lower the price of gas in the United States, which is about 20 cents a liter less than it is in Canada. Like $1.45 average price across the United States, a liter in Canadian dollars. Then I showed David this report, Chicago, a very liberal city, Barack Obama's hometown. Free gas, okay, free gas. Quote, Mayor Lori Lightfoot said prepaid gas and CTA cards will be made available to some Chicagoans to offer relief from high gas prices. We actually have a report here. Do, we, do you still have that, David? From CBS, the CBS affiliate in Chicago. Roll right paper. now, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot just announcing $12.5 million in transportation cost relief. They're calling it Chicago Moves. It's a financial assistance program that will help with the spiking costs of gas, all the rising inflation for so many Chicago residents. It will include prepaid gas part cards and CTA cards, too. Chicago Moves will issue up to 50,000 preloaded gas cards of $150 each to be distributed to eligible residents through a lottery system that can be used at any local uh, Chicago filling station. The mayor also announced distributing 100,000 cards for use on right? public okay, transit. That's good. Yeah, that's free gas. Right? Free gas. Uh, it's 4.87 a gallon in Chicago. David did the math. It's like $1.60 a liter. It's cheaper than Ottawa. Fox 5 New York reports some sort of release at the gas pump remains possible in New York State. One plan would see the state government send gas rebate checks to every owner in the state, every vehicle owner in the state. 
Senator Elijah Reichland Melnick, a Democrat, a Democrat who represents parts of Rockland and Westchester, proposed the $250 gas rebate check legislation. It's crucial, he said. New York State takes whatever action we can to help people who are getting squeezed at the pump. New York State is like the bluest state there is, pretty much. Like, so liberal. Last week, California, I mentioned this. This is right from the website for Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. Nine billion dollars in tax refunds in the form of $400 direct payments per vehicle capped at two vehicles. $400 per vehicle. Tax refund, $400 debit cards for registered vehicle owners and individuals to receive up to two payments. An average California driver spends approximately $300 in gas tax every year. The proposal provides up to two $400 rebates per vehicle for owners to support families with more than one vehicle in use, eligibility based on vehicle registration, not tax records, in order to include seniors who receive Social Security disability income and low-income non-tax filers. Governor's proposal does not have an income cap in order to include all Californians who are facing higher prices due to the cost of oil. Like, he, And he's as liberal as they come, that guy. And yet here, what do we hear from Mr. Trudeau? We've got to phase out fossil fuels and absolutely no apologies for jacking up the price of gas. Even, even British Columbia has an NDP government. Under John Horgan, $110 from the government. Now, in B.C., probably get you half a tank of gas, but hey, it's something. And commercial drivers, $165 from an NDP government, from an NDP government. All right, one more. Cameron, downtown, you're on City News. Hi there. Hi there. Um, I will try to, in fact, this is the best I can and be as eloquent as I can. All right, you have I 90 feel seconds. That 90 seconds? Wow, yeah. okay. I feel that uh, Canadians, we are masochists. We love to keep doing what hurts the most. It's like the people that keep complaining that they're in really bad relationships, but they keep going for the same the same type of individual. Right, and we right. keep doing this to ourselves here. And what I, what I can't get over... This is kind of like uh, the, the pushy salesperson that's coming on too strong and everyone says no. This is exactly what's taking place. And if we're told things like you need to get an electric car in eight years, sounds good. You're paying for it. I'm not buying that. I don't have the money for that. Mm. But if I'm going to be told to go home and eat cake, I hope that the people that have that attitude do remember what happened to the person that said that initially in history. Okay, I'm okay, so all right. to yeah, say this. Okay, 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 okay. Well, okay, you know okay, where it's okay. going. Yeah, 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 I know where, I know, I know, I know, I know where that goes. It goes to the terror. Those were not good times. Okay, okay. Right after the French Revolution, not really the best period in history. Uh, but thank you for your call. Thank you for all your calls. We'll do the talk back hour every morning on the Rob Snow Show between 10 and 11 o'clock. Coming up right after the news from the Eganville leader, the latest from up the line, Bruce McIntyre, will join us on the Rob Snow Show on City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 1st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, two degrees, it's three in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A momentous day for Indigenous people in Canada. A delegation of dozens who travelled to the Vatican heard what they have been asking for for years, a papal apology for the system of residential schools. Today's meeting at the Vatican, a culmination of a week of meetings with Métis, Inuit and First Nations delegates. And I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. That historic papal apology, one that Indigenous peoples had hoped to hear. Pope Francis also begging forgiveness and says he felt indignation and shame for the abuses suffered by Indigenous peoples at the hands of Catholic educators. Sorrow and shame for the role that a number of Catholics, particularly those with educational responsibilities, have had in all these things that wounded you. Phil Fontaine former National Chief of Assembly of First Nations, spoke outside the Vatican. He even went beyond what I hoped to hear from him when he talked about feeling shame and guilt. Pope Francis also announced he'd come to Canada. Indigenous leaders hope he will offer an apology here as well. Laura Carney, City News. City News time, 11.01. And now the forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Well, after a brief warm-up, it's back to cold air and some snow at times. No major accumulations, if anything, just some flurries. He's already reached our high for the day for the afternoon. We'll sit at about two minus four for the low and for the weekend, sun and cloud Saturday, but back to some flurries or showers for Sunday. For today, the high already reached for the afternoon near two. And right now in Ottawa, it is two degrees. It's three degrees in Smith Falls. Ukraine's foreign minister says now that his country's government is back in control of Chernobyl, the nuclear site, it will work with the UN Atomic Agency to determine what the occupying Russians did and mitigate any danger. Russian troops left the heli- heavily contaminated nuclear site earlier today. Dmitro Koleba says Russia made mistakes during the more than four weeks it controlled Chernobyl. Russia uh, behaved irresponsibly in Chernobyl on all accounts from uh, uh, not allowing uh, the personnel of the station to perform their functions in due manner uh, to digging trenches in the contaminated areas. Kaluba also says the Russian government had exposed its soldiers to radiation, endangering their health. City News Time 1103. Prosecutors played audio recordings and showed pictures from inside the Bataclan Theater on November 13th, 2015. They have never been seen before in public, and it exposed the horrors of what happened during this terrorist attack. Some survivors of the Paris attack cried while watching images of corpses piled up inside the concert hall. About 20 others left the courtroom in shock as the sound of music still played as terrorists fired their automatic weapons. 130 people died in the theater and other venues targeted by those terrorists. The province is investing $100,000 upgrading the Twin Elm Rugby Park. Minister in charge Lisa McLeod says the upgrades will provide players and those watching a safer venue. Work will include to the septic system, change rooms, washrooms, as well as a new pad for posts and repairs to the field. City News Time 1103, according to the Eastern Ontario Golf Course opening calendar, You will have five to choose from if you want to get out tomorrow when the sun shines and the temperature hits a balmy eight. Anderson, Emerald and Cloverdale links are all open as is Crooked Creek and Timber Ridge. Also a couple of driving ranges if you don't want to encounter things like temporary greens which may be in place. Mer Bleu and Archie's ranges are both open as of Saturday. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 
Joe had an old bent frog, bigger than a horse, and he barked like a dog. And the only thing quicker than a train upon a track was Big Joe riding on the bullfrog's back. Heave high, heave high, ho, oh, the best man in Ottawa was Mumpera Joe. Mumpera Joe. All right, we missed him on Wednesday, so he's here on Friday. Bruce McIntyre, our Valley correspondent with the Eganville leader, and from time to time, ottawa.citynews.ca. Good morning. Good morning, Rob, on a rainy, snowy day in the valley. You're in the valley today? I'm in the valley, and beautiful, okay. actually, I'm in a field in Pembroke, in an open field. <laughs> really? What are you doing there? Well, two reasons. One, I'm trying to give Dave the best possible signal I can on the phone. As okay. Island. And secondly, Clancy had to go do his business. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, okay. Thanks there for sharing. Go. Thanks for sharing. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Actually, Dave, you know, Dave, my producer Dave was saying, I think I'm going to move to Pembroke. Really? Yeah. Uh, well... <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's housing, 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 and I, I said, okay. well, you, you know, I guess you can move to Pembroke, but what, you know, whatever money you save on housing, it'll go into the gas tank. So I mean, it's that's true. I tell you, I got long gas drive, today. long drive from Pembroke to Ottawa, like it, it hundred miles, a hundred miles. You know, yes. Oh, I did it again. I'm sorry, sorry, Rob. Sorry. That's okay. Poop and scoop. It's uh, it's sorry about that. Yeah, it's a two-hour drive to Ottawa, and uh, our, that's that's the famous route that our MP and uh, the old MP Heckluchie used to uh, drive up and down the highway, racing each other. Cheryl Galag and Heckluchie. They didn't. The, the politics didn't end inside the. Oh uh, no! Province. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, speaking of um, erratic driving, that's on the front page of the Eganville Leader this week, and it's a heck, it's a heck of a picture, and it's a heck of a story. Driver flees scene of Eganville crash. What's the story? Oh, we wish we knew. We still haven't found that fine young person. Um, it, it happened last Friday during the busiest time in Eganville. That's when, uh, in the summertime especially, but it's a very busy stretch of road. It's basically Highway 60 meets Highway 41 is where it happened. Yeah, yeah. And somebody was just driving down. It, the neighbors heard his car crash and it smashed, and they went outside, and they saw this car flipped over on their front, just on their front lawn, and uh, they saw a man walking, actually kind of limping away, and he fled the scene. And so the OPP, the, the kill detachment, OPP, were trying to find them. And they put up the call for the um, OPP capital squad and the canine unit. And you see that photo on the front page. That's, oh, yeah. uh, big yeah. enough, that's taken about uh, 50 yards from Joe Tracy's house. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. The, the, the gentleman was uh, up in the Maple Ridge area. That's where Gerald lives. And boom, they were actually on lockdown. They were told not to leave their homes for the day, for a couple of days. So. Wow. It's interesting. They still haven't found them. I'm not sure. They haven't. They're pretty tight lipped in the information. We're not sure why they're so interested in this person. I mean, it's. it's, uh, it's Maybe it's a fugitive. Place. Maybe it's I, the fugitive. I mean, who he, knows? He, right? he is a fugitive now, that's for sure. <laughs> he wasn't before. He is now. So, but they still the haven't found this guy. I mean, I see the nope. license plate. There's a license plate on the car and everything. So. Uh, yeah. Maybe he went to another place. Maybe home to mom and dad. I don't know. We'll have to yeah, wait and see. But yeah, right. yeah it's uh, but it's, every once in a while we get a little shake up. Uh, and he, it seems that for some reason we always seem to be there at the right time when the OPP and Tatler are looking for someone. We had the, uh, a couple of years ago the man who murdered a Quebec resident to steal the van ended up down in Dacre. Uh, we had the gentleman from Toronto who who took his daughter uh, without permission and went from Toronto to Pembroke and uh, crashed in oh, front yes, of the yes, uh, metal yes, store. Yes. So yeah. for some reason they always come up here. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> so, there you go. Okay. Uh, and that is quite a story. That is quite a yeah. story. Now, um, this is the time when uh, municipalities, big and small, uh, they a big topic at the municipal level is pay. Pay for councillors, <laughs> pay for the mayor, how much are people making, you know, it's sunshine list and all of this stuff. So, um, give, us some, give us some of the numbers, the rundown. Well, for Renfrew, the entire council, that's Mayor Don Eady and the five councillors and the Reeve, Peter Emo, they clocked in at $156,000 for all of them. Actually, 157 for all of them. For the, for the, whole, for the, whole, for the mayor and six councillors. <laughs> oh, and sorry, and one board member. And one board, <laughs> board member. member. Yeah, but they, um, Renfrew doesn't, uh, they don't give 000. stipends for uh, board members, for residents, just one they do, and that's the police wow. board. That's mandated. So, yeah, 156899 yeah. The whole council, and in, the whole council in Renfrew gets paid less than the mayor of Ottawa. So there you go. Isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Jim's in a league of his own. He's missing. He knows everybody, so I guess he's worth his dollars. There he goes to every event. Right. But, but let me ask other, you this, Bruce. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I mean, you've been covering uh, that Renfrew council for a long time now. Um, 
I mean, how does it break down? Like the mayor would make how much, a counselor would make how much. Do you know that offhand? Or, yeah, uh, well, the, yeah, the mayor makes approximately $42,000. Okay, and okay. the Reeve, Peter Emo, he makes a bit more. Uh, actually, he, his salary last year was 20, 22000 Peter does a lot of traveling uh, as a past warden in Renfrew County, and he's he's a very good asset. He knows everybody in Queen's Park, so he'll quite often go down and make some lobbying efforts. And the rest of the counselors average between fifteen to, between fifteen to seventeen to 22000 So let's say seventeen, eighteen thousand 18000 is the uh, median. And the board member, uh, Mr. Uh, the, for the Police Services Board, he received... 3600 for the year, and that's a $300 increase from last year. <laughs> so, right, okay, okay. Yeah. But like this, they, this figure, 42000 42000 for the mayor. Yep. Right. Is that considered a part-time job, or is that a full-time job, or It or is. What? Uh, Don, Don treats it as a full-time job. Yeah. I know that, for example, next Does he year, have another Harper, job? Does he have another nope. job? No. He did. He, he used to own a drapery shop. Okay. And uh, he he sold that about 10 years ago, and he shot it on the mayor. I know that in Armfryer, they have made a move to make the mayor a full time position, and he'll be paid as such. Walter Stack is the mayor now, and uh, when the next council comes in, uh, in October, the, the mayor will be a, considered a full time job, which they really is. I mean, I, I know Don quite well, and he's, again, a 50 hour work week. He takes it very seriously. So they're worth they're worth their money, um, and uh, they were they work every dollar. Then we have the county councillors, Rob. Yeah, the I mean, county but... councillors are going to be paid more. <laughs> um, wow, um, quite quite a lot more. Although in the grand scheme of things, not huge huge money. No, there, it's a, it's a forty five forty six percent increase over four years. Wow. But it's uh, I, I have issues with that. I know my colleague Deb, she covers county council, and she said when they brought in about four years ago, the strictly the salary, not the uh, attendance. She sees three or four empty seats every council meeting. Before there, you'd be very rare to see one empty seat, but now you're seeing three or four each meeting. They always make quorum, but some councillors say. For some reason, they just can't make it. They're, they get paid anyway. And uh, we had a little debate in our office about that, and I don't agree. I think it should be attendance. Um, you're paid. You show up. You're paid. That's the way they've always done it. But they, they made that switch about five years ago. And that raise that they voted in, it's not for them. It does not affect them this term. It takes effect in November when the new council comes in. So that way, uh, one thing they do very well is most c- councils do not um, set the pay grid by themselves. They'll do it for the following, for the incoming council or the other citizens group do it because it's not fair to ask someone how much are you worth. It's, it's, not, it's not fair to put on the councillors or the elected, and I think that's a good system they have. Okay. So, and they, uh, they all voted in favor except for one mayor, Jennifer Murphy. She voted against it. Uh, she's the mayor of Bonacher Valley, Eganville. You can say she did it in principle. You can say she did it because of an election year. Who knows? <laughs> you know, right. When, right. She, when she goes to the ballot box, I didn't vote for that. It wasn't me. So, but um, she also is very, very prudent with her money. So I think it's more, I think it's half and half. Okay. Uh, tell us about uh, the OPP uh, and calls for service in, in Pembroke during the pandemic and what trends the OPP was uh yeah, thing. it's it's very strange. Uh, uh, Inspector Newfeld, the detachment commander for Upper Ottawa Valley, was making a presentation to Laurentian Valley Council, and the numbers were down for certain areas. And they said, "Don't don't get too excited. I think those numbers are skewed because of COVID." And he said, "We had a huge spike in suspicious vehicles calls." And he said, "All of a sudden, uh, people are working from home. They haven't been at home during the week for years, and they see a blue Chevy out there. What's that car doing out there? And it's been out there for three days. I'm calling." And for all they know, it's probably gone at nighttime when they get home, but they had a large increase in suspicious calls, uh, vehicles. They had a very big drop in property damage. Again, people are home during the day. Uh, uh, drop in uh, a rise in violent crimes, unfortunately, violent involved. But the biggest change was, he said his OPP officers were suddenly mediators. They've always had the odd call for service when a, uh, a custody is getting placed and the, and the husband and wife are arguing and the child's involved. They're, they get them once in a while. But they were getting more and more calls um, dealing with uh, COVID. Uh, he gave me a specific example. A woman uh, did not was not going to release her child because her husband worked at uh, Pembroke Regional Hospital and because it was highly contagious, there was a breakout there, she was not going to let her son go home with him for the weekend. 
And there you have the OVB officer in the middle there. It's like, what do you do? Like, is, is she being realistic and is she being sincere or is she just being malicious, finding an excuse not to let the, the child go? But they, whoever has a court order says they get them, they get them. But they were more and more calls, and Stefan said it's, it's still going on. Um, something, they're not trained for that. They're not trained to be social workers. They're trained to be police officers. And they were found, they found themselves very uncomfortable in awkward situations, especially when they go up by themselves. They, they, don't, they don't go in uh, pairs up here. They're single vehicles, and they go by themselves. And they always get a backup. If something was going on, they call for the backup. And another thing that they, they got was they got very few calls on people wearing, not wearing a mask in a store. And Stefan said they didn't go. They, they, didn't, they didn't bother attending. If there, unless there was something really serious, they went to one. And the people were there with a the video camera. They, they were set up. They wanted to see how the police would react. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, but right. over, overall, they didn't attend those calls. They just said, nope, nope. And uh, impaired driving was up, um, which, again, happened in Ottawa as well. Yeah, as, there was a story uh, about that yesterday, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's, yeah, that's kind yeah. of a common trend. So Stefan said, wait till next year, and we'll see if the numbers are coordinated, because he wasn't going to adjust his scheduling at all or operations. He said, this is, to me, is an anomaly, and we'll see what happens next year. If this is the trend, then we'll readjust our scheduling and our operations. Really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a weekly scan of the want ads. Boy, this place, um, <laughs> uh, Bonashir Manor, always hiring there. They're always hiring there. Um, and it really, it shows you kind of like the 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 uh, hierarchy of health care. So they're high, oh. they want an RN. They need an RN. Part-time hours, RN. Uh, starts in year one. Let me see here. Uh, 47 bucks an hour, second year, 49 bucks an hour, third year, 56 bucks an hour. Uh, and by the eighth year, you're making f- almost $57 an hour. Okay. So that's yeah. for the RN. The RPN starts at $32 an hour and the PSW starts at 26. But that, that includes your paid lunch break. <laughs> yeah, but always hiring that place. It's, it's, well, it's, um, long-term care is a very, very difficult job. I, have, I know people have blown their backs out, you know, lifting the, yep, the yep, residents. Yep, yep. it's, it's not easy. It's not an no, easy it job. it must be yeah. even more difficult now to attract people to, into that space. Yeah. Think, so, yeah. all right, Bruce. We'll talk to you next week, eh? Thank you, Rob. Hopefully. Enjoy the weekend. Yep, and thanks. for all your listeners, it's Maple Syrup Festival up in the valley. Come on up and get some maple syrup. Okay, great advice, Bruce. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Bye-bye from the Eganville Leader. That's Valley View. Bruce McIntyre. Wow, what a what a what a week for Ottawa Senators fans. We have much to talk about this week with Steve Warren of the Sens Nation podcast. That's coming right up here on City News. It really is a tremendous source of excitement and joy for the theater staff and I to welcome artists finally back to the theaters. It was a tremendous pleasure to sit on the selection committee. We really have something to cater to all musical tastes, from trippy art pop to straight ahead rock and roll to soul and funk. Um, But it's huge for us to be able to welcome local artists back into the theaters um, to showcase their amazing talents uh, for people here. Up to the top is where I'm headed and I'm going. You know what, I've checked out some of this stuff already before uh, doing this. I've been hyped and, and, and ready to do this because uh, it's definitely being done on a major level and you know I'm here seeing it in person right now and I'm like wow you know this is what it is man I'm, I'm happy to be here. This kind of concert series promotes music and gives us uh, newcomers or even like new bands a big chance to uh, showcase their talents and share their music with the world. It's amazing that Omike oh has organized this and given an opportunity for artists to perform but also um, be part of something that they wouldn't, we wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be able to create this just on my own. So everybody's talents comes together to create something great. It says a lot about the city that they are engaging the processes that get those musicians out and get them in front of people and the music is getting heard. So we don't have a thing where like everybody's the best kept secret, right? We're sort of breaking through that wall a lot and which is exactly what we need. Well, first of all, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. For me, it's a little bit like being officially part of the local artist community in Ottawa. And it's like my first real big show where I'm going to be performing my own song. So it's really exciting. 
the hell's going on? Why you still holding on? You know, it's a great opportunity for us artists to be able to really get a, a reach to an audience uh, and uh, a good uh, a good quality audience too. I'm just happy that I can be involved. I'm happy that I can add value. It's top tier, top tier for sure. It really is like a dream come true, especially having so many restrictions in the last couple of years, not being able to jam because you couldn't get together and then to be able to do it in a beautiful venue like this with the seats in the background and just the whole entourage of it and really feeling like we're able to put on a real show for the first time in a long time, it's, it's just fantastic. It really is great. the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. There is so much to talk about about the Ottawa Senators this week to, as we welcome back from the Sense Nation podcast, sensenationhockey.com, Steve Warren. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. How are you? My gosh, uh, what a week to be a Senators fan. Um, the stunning news about the passing of, of Eugene Melnick. Steve, uh, you've been a, a sports broadcaster in this town for decades a tenure that in includes the entirety of the ownership of uh, Eugene Melnick of the Ottawa Senators. What, what, are, what were your experiences with him, um, your impressions of him, uh, Eugene Melnick? Well, he was a guy who was passionate uh, about business and hockey, uh, but he was also difficult. He was volatile, and most fans would know that he was frugal. And I think uh, that, that really led to some strained relationships with employees, the media, and the fan base. Um, I didn't have a ton of dealings with him. Yeah. There was a time there when I was doing some promotional work for the Senators, and they flew us down to, Bar, uh, to Barbados for some just shooting video down there and uh, spent a little bit of time with him. And the one thing I will say is that he is as big a passionate Sens fan or was uh, as anyone you'll come across. That was in my uh, in my times with him down there. That would be the one overriding thought I have about Eugene Melnick. Really? Yeah. 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 Okay. But, uh, already, people are talking about what does it mean for the future of the team? What are the, what, what does it mean for the future of the team? What do you make of these reports that investors are already, you know, expressing interest in buying the Ottawa Senators? What, what, what do you make of those, Steve? Well, I think there's no question that there have been investors over the last five to ten years who've been doing just that. And uh, now they're, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that there'll be some time that goes by before, you know, actual submissions occur. Yeah. But I certainly think there are investors out there who see that, you know, that it sounds like his daughters have been left the franchise and probably there are investors out there who, who see a business opportunity. And, uh, yeah, it wouldn't shock me at all if, if that's happening right now. And, and that's, that's the big, big two questions, you know, who's going to be the next long-term owner of this team and, and will the Sens reemerge as a LeBreton flats partner and eventually move downtown? Yeah. Yeah. Because that seemed that seemed over that whole LeBreton thing, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. it seemed if anything they were they were he he was more interested in either I don't know renovating Canadian Tire Center or blowing it up and building something new there or 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 whatnot. I mean, there's a lot of land out there, so um, but now maybe LeBreton is very much back in play. Who knows? I mean, it's just. Well, I don't think there was ever a time where Eugene Melnick was not interested in a downtown rink. I just don't know how interested he was in paying for very much of it. Right. Um, right. I, I just I, I think 
you know, there's, there's no question now. I think that um, Melnick was probably your biggest roadblock to a downtown NHL arena because, you know, there was lawsuits happening. You've heard what Jim Watson has had to say, and there was just a lot of eye-rolling and uh, upset about the way Melnick had handled those negotiations. So you'd have to think with new ownership that that reopens the possibility of a move downtown. Okay. All this talk about Quebec City this week is just kind of strange to me. I don't know why Ottawa would want to share the World Juniors with a city that's like four and a half, five hours away. And uh, even more bizarre is why the Senators would give up any home games that to have them in Quebec City. Um, I, I, I guess maybe Quebec City would compensate the Sens for the lost gate or whatever, but uh, just... What do you make of these these stories, Steve? What's with all this talk about Quebec City this week? Well, I think it's uh, Anthony LeBlanc is the director, or the or rather the president of business operations. Uh, he basically admitted that yeah, there's some talks going on right now between uh, Ottawa and Quebec City about the idea of co-hosting the World Juniors together. And in the process of that, I guess that Quebec City had overtures for the Sens to maybe play five games there and. Uh, particularly right now when Sens fans are feeling a little uncertain about, you know, the new world order. Yeah. Uh, LeBlanc probably should have shot down the idea completely. Yeah. Uh, he's actually quoted as saying, we've told Quebec City that's interesting, but that's as far as it's gone. Uh, probably the word interesting in there is uh, concerning. But anyway, um, I think that it's, it's certainly a possibility. And, it, and, and I guess beyond Quebec City, who else was – uh, in on this was was Gary Bettman helping this along was Mr. Melnick himself maybe seeing the attendance right now as a concern mm. and if Quebec City is willing to pay say the equivalent of five sellouts then maybe that's something we kick yeah, the tires maybe, on but yeah maybe but you know the ultimate goal is for Mr. Palado to get a team right he's got a building but no team and he, not only does he have a building he's got a news network he's got a sports news network <laughs> I mean in in kind of this world of of sports media integration you know it'd be a perfect fit but i think quebec city's got to get over it they're never getting a team they're never getting a team gary bettman's job is to grow the the league the nhl and that means putting it in cities where people don't watch hockey and putting a team in quebec city people watch hockey in quebec city already that doesn't do anything for the national hockey league to me yeah, and I think, you know, I don't know if Quebec City's ever going to get a franchise or not. I do know this, though, that they're not getting the Ottawa Senators. And this may well be, and I think the Sens are not happy with the timing of all this speculation getting out there the same week that Mr. Melnick passes away. Yeah. But it may have been a pre-planned shot across the bow. We start talking about Quebec City and the Ottawa market, and uh, and maybe that helps grease the skids um, and, uh, you know, gets attendance up gets the city of Ottawa and the NCC excited about, oh, no, they might lose the team to Quebec City if we don't, you know, make things happen. I don't know. It's all speculation, but the timing is very, very curious. Okay. You know, Steve, when you join us next week, it'll be the second round of the Masters. Oh, baby. You think Tiger will be playing? What do you think, Steve? Tiger Woods in the Masters? I'm 60-40, yes. Really? Holy yep. cow. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he played a practice round this week at Augusta. Yeah. Um, I was uh, reading uh, the Golf Channel. Their senior writer there basically said that uh, he saw it, and he said Tiger is all back as far as his game goes. Wow. The issue is you get six rounds of golf to play, and then that's one of the hillier courses the PGA plays all year, uh, Augusta National. You get six rounds with a practice round, Pro-Am, four competitive days. So that's, that's going to be a tough one. But from all the reports, he looks really strong, and I'm I'm just even if he's got a limp home man, on Saturday man. and Sunday, holy cow! I, we we've seen it before with this guy, oh, and I'm not man. putting it past him. So holy smokes, play. man! Oh man! I mean, the Masters is already my favorite golf tournament already, but Tiger playing, my gosh! Okay, can't wait to talk to you next week, Steve. Same here, Rob. Yeah, thanks again, Steve Warren, Sens Nation podcast. SensationHockey.com. My gosh, what a week in sports. News coming up and then Queen's Park Week in Review on the Rob Snow Show on City News. 
Being a crossing guard works great as part of my schedule as a high school student because I still have time to do my tests and assignments while earning a little bit of cash on the side. It fits, working as a crossing guard fits into my current lifestyle because it gives me a lot of time during the day to pursue hobbies that I'm very interested in. A friend of mine introduced me to this job. Uh, I didn't know it was actually a, a paid job. I always start my day. It's a very little, I guess, few months, baby. And she always comes with her dad on a pram. And uh, the smile she has, like, oh, my God. Well, I think the OSC is a, a very good employer. Uh, they, they show quite clearly that they care about you. They're very polite. They really make you feel like you're part of a family. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Gets us out of the house, too. Yeah. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. This is Friday, the 1st of April. Good morning, I'm Jason White. Right now, a gray, cloudy sky, two degrees in Ottawa. It is four in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news right now. Breaking news from Canada's top public health officer who says more waves of COVID-19 are likely as the virus is still circulating widely and further resurgence is possible. She points to federal modeling and urges anyone who is not vaccinated against COVID-19 to do so soon to stave off serious disease or even death from the virus. Ontario's health minister says it is not necessary to reintroduce public health measures to control COVID-19. Christine Elliott says the current rising cases wasn't unexpected after the province ended most public health health measures like mask mandates. Gatineau police charging a third person in connection with a fatal fire back in January. Steve Saray arrested at the Hull Jail where he was already being held in a different case. He's now charged with arson, endangering human life, conspiracy and second degree homicide. The province is spending $100,000 to spruce up the Twin Elm Rugby Park. Sport Minister Lisa McLeod says the upgrades will provide players and spectators a safer venue. The money will go into things like work on the septic system, change rooms and washrooms, as well as new pad posts and field repairs. City News Time 1133. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, the gang's all here. It's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. And oh my goodness gracious. This is the original Queen's Park Week in Review gang right here. We have on the line today, Gilles Bisson, New Democrat from Timmins. Where are you today, Gilles? Today I'm in Whitby. In Whitby, okay, in Whitby, okay, all right. Uh, John Fraser, Liberal, Ottawa South. Where are you, John? I'm in Ottawa South. In Ottawa I'm South, sure. and guess who's back? The Yak is back. The Yak is back. John Yakabuski, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, PCMPP. Welcome back. Good to be back. Well, John Yakabuski, my goodness gracious, it's been too long. We need you to sing us to the finish line with a little kumbaya later on just for yeah. old time's sake. Now, it's like a, re a reunion tour. The it is a reunion. It is a reunion. Yeah, I'm loving it. Okay. Well, the big deal this week is uh, Trudeau-Ford, the agreement, 
$10 a day child care coming to Ontario with uh, savings retroactive to, to April 1st when everything gets sorted out. The question will be, John Yakabuski, what took you so long? Well, there, that, that's a good question, uh, Rob, and I, and I know that my friend Mr. Fraser and Mr. Bisson will, will be, should be very happy that we took the uh, ordinate amount of time to get, to get a good deal, the right deal for Ontario, because the reality is that uh, uh, Mr. Del Duca and uh, Andrea Horvath were clamoring to take the first deal that was offered. And our government said, no, our job is to ensure that we get the best deal for the people of Ontario. And that's exactly what we've done. This bill, this uh, deal amounts to an extra $3 billion, essentially over six years, not five, over six years. So we've got $3 billion and another year to ensure that the right deal was made for Ontario families. And of course, uh, a beginning in May, retroactive to April 1st, uh, parents will see a 25% uh, reduction in their child care costs and a 50% reduction by the end of the end of the year and we have to remember that this is hugely important and of course the I mean it's a it's an initiative of the by the federal government to work with the provinces and that's why we made sure that we got the right deal from Ontarians because in the previous government as uh, John Fraser would know child care in Ontario went up 400% under their watch they talked about low-cost child care but they weren't they weren't delivering. We're delivering for the people of Ontario. This is a great deal for parents, a great deal for Ontario, and it's going to add to the uh, lead to the creation of 86,000 new high-quality spaces as well for children five years old, five years old and younger. Uh, hiring of uh, new child ed educators because obviously if you're going to have more spaces, you've got to have the staff, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing this um, manifest itself in the in a deal that. Work, All right. uh, okay, it done. works best for the people of Ontario, the parents, and allows uh, working families to feel comfortable um, about uh, their participation in the Ontario economy. All right, John Fraser, uh, 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 certainly a better deal, uh, John Yakubuski says, than anything that your government managed to come up with. How do you well, respond to that? I just, uh, I would just say to him, full day kindergarten that's been going for eight years, it's saved families thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars each year in childcare. But here's the thing this is what I'm trying to figure out. I don't know how you say something's retroactive when it's in front of you. So, like, on the beginning of the week, he said it's going to be retroactive to April 1st. Retroactive means from behind you. What they really should have said is it's going to start April 1st. When you say retroactive, it's like what we're saying, it's retroactive to January 1st, where we're saying each family should get back 2750 per child because they had to wait six to seven months more than anybody did in any other province. So but the idea was another year of the world retroactive. It's not retroactive. It starts today. <laughs> it's like they announced it on Monday. It starts today. It wasn't retroactive. Nothing's retroactive. All right, hold on, hold on, John Yakubowski. Well, John, that's your biggest criticism. I guess we got it right because we're doing it an extra year. It's going over six years. All right, hold on, hold. On. Let me hear from Jill. Let me hear from Jill. Let's 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 hear from Jill. Jill. Well, Jill. Listen, Go ahead, Jill. You know the government. You know apparently the government held out in order to get a better deal. Yeah. What they ended up was exactly the same deal as every other province got. The additional money is just them acknowledging they're going to get money in the sixth year and they're going to move it forward. That's all that is. Uh, every other province of Ontario can get exactly the same deal just by renewing the agreement after five years. So this is not holding out to get more money. Yes, the government tried to hold out to get more money, and I, I understand that, and as a taxpayer, I respect that, uh, but it's all out of the same taxpayer, no matter who pays for it. Uh, but in the end, they got the deal that everybody else got, and we didn't have a program in place six, seven, eight months ago, nine months ago, when we could have. So a lot of parents were without daycare uh, that could have been provided uh, in a much more affordable way because Mr. Ford said we're going to get a better deal, but at the end, all they're doing is they're saying, here's the money for the sixth year. It's like saying, hey, guess what, Rob? Uh, I'm taking your salary that you're going to get over the next five years, announcing that's what you're going to get in five years. And by the way, you got more money because I just added the sixth year in the deal. It's still the same amount of money. But Rob, no other province has a sixth year, which there is no assurance from the federal government that there will be anything after five years. We of have a six-year deal. John. That is a big yeah. John. It's $3 billion yeah. more for the people of Ontario. John, the people from this year, 
behind us last year, right? They're not getting any money, whereas people in other provinces did. They're out. Yeah, you've added another year on the end. You didn't get more, you just moved it out. And what we're saying is there's a bunch of families that should have got more affordable child care this year, but you waited because you wanted it to be closer to the election. I just, I just don't think they should be out. Any the truth to that, John Yakubuski? Do you, you, you drag this out? Do you rag the puck, John Yakubuski? Your government rag the puck here for election timing, John, or what? Absolutely not, Rob. Uh, as, as you know, as we said from the start, when the first deal was proposed, we said this is not the right deal for Ontario. Mm. We're going to continue to negotiate with the federal government to make sure that the deal that we sign at the end of the day is the best deal for the people of Ontario. And that's what we are absolutely confident that we have done. But, they got, but, but, but my last point, I just kind of go right, back right. to what okay. I did. Okay. We right. essentially got the same deal that every other province did, except <laughs> they added the sixth year in, and the federal government will renew this in five years. Every province will be able to get the same thing. So we were out for about nine months of child care for parents out there because the government tried to get a better deal, and I understand that, but they didn't. So let's not pretend right. it's okay. So, so, so what would the New Democrats have done? Well, listen, you know that we have been for years advocating that we move to $10 a day daycare. Shelley Martell, when she was a, when she was a member, uh, and Howard Hampton was a leader, we were advocating that. And I'm glad that the federal government finally came around because the federal NDP has been pushing that issue federally. So we think this is a good thing. Parents need help when it comes to daycare. And absolutely, this is good news. Mm-hmm. But let's not pretend that we got a better deal than we did. Okay. And John, what would your party be doing? What I just told you right now, we would make it retroactive. We would have signed a deal earlier. Right now, what we're okay. saying is we're going to make it retroactive to January 1st, which means twenty-seven fifty per child, per family. Right. What about it done? I mean, it's, people need the money now. Right? Okay. The money now. It's easy to say what you would have done. I would have bought the winning lottery tickets if I knew what the winning numbers were, but <laughs> we're the ones who don't have that. that right. have signed the deal, and we've signed a deal that is the right deal for the people of Ontario. Okay. Do you think, John Yakubuski, I haven't talked to you in a while, so I want to ask, this is kind of a turning point for for conservatives or even progressive conservatives. Um, you know, this, the, 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 like, elections have been fought and won and lost over this whole issue of whether we should have a, a program like this, like a Quebec-style daycare program. Um, you know, Mr. Harper, for example, did, uh, you know, he didn't prefer, uh, you know, big, big, big government, a uh, big government social program like a child care program. He, the, the alternative being let the parents decide and, and, you know, give them money so that they can uh, pay for child care on their own. This was part of the pitch from the premier four years ago. Uh, but now, I, I don't know, we have Doug Ford has signed on, Jason Kenney signed on, Scott Moe, Blaine Higgs out in, in, in uh, New Brunswick is a, is a conservative premier, a progressive conservative premier in Nova Scotia, he's part of it, a progressive conservative premier in Prince Edward Island signed on to this. Like, is it, are, are, are PCers like now they've come around and realized that there's value in this kind of program, John? Like, what what has led to this change? I, uh... Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say, Rob, that uh, there was never a, a federal offer on the table uh, to finance the, uh, the bulk of this program. Right. And uh, they talked about it many times at the federal level in different parties, but the reality is that uh, they have now come to the table with significant amounts of money because the provinces certainly had to cons- consider their fiscal abilities to uh, to do these on their own. So now you have a, a partnership between the two levels of government. It made it uh, made it a better deal. Like Trudeau made you an offer taxpayer. you couldn't refuse, and that's what uh, that's what uh, when we saw a deal that made sense for the people of Ontario, and we were able to uh, make improvements to that deal. Okay. Uh, we we're ready to do it. All right, let's move along here. I had. Um, some health experts on my show this week. I know uh, our news team has worked hard on this story all week. Same with my colleague here, Sam LaPratt at City News. Sixth wave, guys, sixth wave of COVID-19 is here. Sixth wave. Um, should the government be doing anything? There, there, there is, there, there, 
like we haven't hit a level yet where the government seems to want to, you know, reimpose capacity limits or bring back a mask mandate, anything like that. Um, just kind of going to kind of ride it out here, I guess. Uh, what do you think about that? Let's uh, ask that to Gilles Bisson. Gilles, what do you think, Gilles? Well, I think, yeah, we are getting into a sixth wave. I think we all know in our personal lives more people that have got COVID now than before. I, I know I know in the legislature there's at least four or five people who are members who have got COVID. We haven't seen that in a while. Uh, so, yeah, there. I think there's some things that the government did right and there's some things that the government did wrong. We need to have a good program for sick days so that if somebody doesn't feel well and they test positive, they can stay home mm -hmm. and not go and infect the rest of the people that work wherever it is. I think mask mandate, like, a, you know, uh, going back and shutting down the economy, I don't think anybody wants that. No. Uh, but I do think that most people were okay with the masks. And I think especially in, like, we, we kept them in place for things like transit. Yeah. We should have kept them in place, I think, for schools uh, would have been one thing. And I think what is really indicative of the problem that we have with the sixth wave, the government was going to was going to end uh, the program to provide uh, free testing. You know the yeah. Well, they've expanded. They, they've extended that now to the end of they've July. So, it. so I think yeah. they understand, as all of us, that we're going back into it. So I think the government could have done some things differently. And I think you know people are putting their guard down. I was out at the Metro uh, grocery store making supper for my grandkids last night. And I notice it's now down to about, there's about 20% of people that don't wear a mask, including staff, right? So it's going to get worse. There's no question. All right, John Fraser. Look, I, you know, I, the single most, you know, important thing we can do right now uh, is encourage people to get vaccinated. Uh, Ontarians, um, you know, um, did a good job uh, by most parts in the first number of ways. Yeah. But our booster doses for the general population are at about 55%, and that's not going to cut it. And for our kids, uh, we're at the back of the pack in, in Canada, it's five for five to 11 year olds, you know, about 55% have got a first dose, less than a third have a second dose. That's not gonna cut it either. So I, you know, I, was, I was surprised when I saw the, the government's reopening plan, which they put out this week, and it only mentions vaccines with relation once with relations to manufacturing, which is not what we agreed now. What we need is a plan to actually uh, encourage people to get vaccinated to say, look, vaccines are safe and effective. We know that it's helped us through the first few waves. Um, here's where you can get some information no, about vaccines. Know, John, so you can make an informed come choice. On, John, and, come on, John. And, I mean, we have, we have vaccination rates at ninety percent here. No, no, in but, Ontario. But, but, no, it's not because if you're th for your third dose, which is giving you maximum protection from severe illness uh, and uh, and death, uh, only about 50% of the population have it. Our kids, only about 50% of them right. have a first dose. But that's dose, not because there's any kind of lack of capacity no, no. or anything like that, no, no, John. It's, I mean, it's, it's, no, no, it's communicating it. It's just like communicating, it's communicating it to okay. people. That, All right. I, All right. Look, here, I'll tell you why. Just keep one, give me one more second. All right. Okay. Anti-vaxxers are working 24-7 on the web, every day yeah we hear that misinformation we see it so we need to do the same thing we have to fight that fight okay because, okay you know, and, let's hear from john yakabuski here let's happens. hear from john yakabuski here john john yakabuski sixth wave john what's uh, what's the government's plan to deal with the sixth wave yeah first off um we made it clear that we were expecting and we're aware that there would be a an increase in cases uh, once the uh, the mandates were lifted that is not a surprise but we have the capacity in our in our city in our healthcare system uh, to manage that. Uh, the reality is that we do have, as as you articulated to John Fraser, you know the highest rates of first and second doses across the country. Uh, that, along with uh, natural immunity and the arrival of antivirals, we do believe we have the tools necessary to handle the impact of the virus. I mean, science says that uh, it's it, it is far more uh, transmissible than those in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but but not as virulent, and so we're prepared, and we believe we're ready, and we're and then we're good. we take the advice of uh, Dr. Moore, who follows this uh, on a 24/7 basis. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, we, we're not. We know what the the numbers uh, are, what's happening with the numbers, and we're very cognizant of that, and we're still continuing to encourage people uh, to get vaccinated. We'd love to see those numbers continue to rise, particularly with the third doses, and also 
for people to be very wary of the circumstances they're in. So use that use that good judgment uh, to be uh, you know if you're in a, a tight place, it's it's not a bad uh, thought to be considering wearing right. a mask to protect you and of the course. other people around you as this. Um, you know, the increase uh, continues to manifest itself. Okay. We've made those things clear all along as we uh, expected that we would see uh, numbers rise. And we're, we're hoping, too, that the, the public recognizes that, that there is measures they can all take to protect themselves and their neighbor uh, in high uh, traffic and high um, um, attendance uh, um, areas all right we'll be right back uh we won't have a lot of time in the second half but we uh will touch on a few things when we come back queen's park week in review rob snow show city news John Fraser, Liberal MP, Ottawa South, Liberal MPB, Ottawa South. Uh, John Yakabuski, Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke, Progressive Conservative, and uh, Gilles Bisson, Timmins, New Democrat. Look, we only have three minutes left, so I'm not going to get into a heavy duty, heavy duty topic. I will say this, though. John Yakabuski, one of my f- f- most favorite memories of Queen's Park and covering Queen's Park is Dalton McGinty has a minority government. And there are all kinds of rumors that he's trying to entice people to cross the floor. Because he wasn't too many uh, seats shy of majority, as I recall. So if he could just get a few people to cross the floor, the Liberals would have their way again. 
It wouldn't have to be propped up by Jill and the New Democrats. Oh. And Dalton, Dalton McGinty, stands in the in the legislature and says, "We'll take anybody, Mr. Speaker. We'll take anybody, but Yakubuski." <laughs> 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 I thought that was hilarious. I thought that was hilarious. Now, Jill, are you running again? You're running in the election again? Absolutely running again. Yes, okay. sir. When did you first run? I ran in 1990. In 1990. Wow. Holy smokes, Jill. Wow. I've had it a long time. Um, John, you're running again? John Yakabuski, you're running again? John Yakabuski, are you running again? I am. You are? Okay. Yeah. And when were you first elected? In 2003? 2003. Okay. Okay. All right. And John Fraser, you're running again, too. Yes, I am. I'm 2013, so I'm the young pup here. <laughs> okay. Okay. I remember. And so, so Don McGinty said he wouldn't take John Yakubuski, but he was glad to. He'd take Don any Fraser. other MPP except for John Yakubuski. <laughs> yeah. He ended up with Elizabeth Whitmer. He ended up with Elizabeth Whitmer with one seat. And she took the work. She took the workers' compensation board, and then they lost the by-election to the New Democrats, which was Catherine uh, Catherine Fife. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that's all how right. that went. Yeah. And of course, in any parliament, either majority or minority, your job is to try to advance the issues that are important to you. Yeah. And in a minority parliament, that's a lot easier. That's what we saw federally, and that's what we saw uh, during that particular minority. So I just for the record, oh yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 well, that's what John, Parliament's about. Yeah. Just Sorry, John Fraser. Record. Go ahead, John Fraser. Yeah. I, just for the record, yeah. I would take John Yakubuski in a heartbeat. You would. Okay. He's got a great voice. <laughs> he does have a funny. terrific voice. I, I just want to sing John. at those events, John. I, I don't, John, I you're a good exactly, friend. And I, I don't. We, we don't agree. All yeah. We yeah. No. We don't agree on. We do get along. Yeah, a whole bunch of see, that's the thing, Rob. See? That people you need know to understand. What? We actually all get along. Oh, I know. John is actually a good friend of both. Both John and I, right? So I it's the way it works. All right, John Yakubuski. You uh, remember, you, Jill, when I came to entertain at your uh, year-end party Oh, that my time. God. You came to our whips party in order to entertain. Oh, that was hilarious. Yeah, we won't talk yeah. about that. All right, all right. So <laughs> we, we, we're out of time anyway. So everybody with me, kumbaya, kumbaya. kumbaya. There you go. There you go. I missed that. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not going to be a lot of kumbaya over the next couple of months, so it was nice to have a little bit of it today. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, yeah. Queen's Park, Queen's Park Week in Review with three veterans who are uh, running for re-election, and uh, it won't all be uh, that nice during the campaign. This is the Rob Snow Show. Have a nice weekend. Back on Monday after the 9 o'clock news, Sam LaPrade and her program, The Sam LaPrade Show, right after the new news update here on City News. The Rob Snow Show. Tune in weekdays starting at 9 on Rogers TV and City News, 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m., it's the RTV Quiz. Giovanni Petiti hosts a weekly trivia competition that lets you play from the comfort of your couch. Play along at home and challenge your friends. And don't forget to follow along on social media. Let us know who's top of trivia and you can find 